off the A+, plus, right? Uh, as I mentioned before when there was only a few of you in the chat, uh, this is going to be a super simplistic format, right? Um, I don't do PowerPoints. I'm not reading paragraphs of crap at you. That's not my style. There's a lot of pictures, and I kind of expect a lot of conversation or questions back and forth. This will make it uh, you know, not boring. We're going to kick off A+, plus with something very simple. Now, half of this material, yeah, I'm going to say take notes on stuff, right? But half this material, I'm also going to say, hey, by the way, you don't have to answer these questions on the exam. Like, for example, when we're talking about converting binary numbers, there's no, like, what is this in binary question from the exam. However, this is one of those things where this is a foundational skill that you have to know, and specifically, like, for us going into networking. You have to know this for networking, but this is kind of the... Uh, the base foundation. So kicking it off, binary or base two. So the entire computer world, binary right? Or base two. So the entire computer world, right? Oh, uh, this is somebody hot mic and echoing. There we go. But the entire computer world is based off of binary, base two, like zeros and ones, right? Now some of you may know this already. Some of you, this might be brand new. Just keep in mind we have people who are brand new. We have people who are getting prepared to teach A+. So we have a whole span of uh, knowledge bases in the chat right now. So when you hear that word bit, that binary bit word, like it, I think we've all heard like 64 or 32 bit. A bit is literally just a binary number, a zero or a one. It's also very key that you know that eight bits is equal to one byte. So I think this, this introduces a lot of confusion sometimes. When, when we refer to bits, and like megabits or gigabits per second, bits is usually a, an indication of like transfer rate or speed. Whereas bytes describe volume. So I might download like a 10 megabyte picture at 10 megabits per second. Well, hopefully not 10 megabits per second, that'd be sad, but am I explaining that well enough? I'm with you, man. I love it. Tracking, tracking. I know my, my... I'm soaking every little bit of this in. Don't you worry. <laughs> I, I know my Microsoft Paint is just blowing everybody away, right? With my graphic design skills. There's an elegance in the simplicity. There is. I mean, it's a, it's caveman style. It's kind of my. I mean, that's how I learn. I have to learn with uh, colors and whatnot. I, I <laughs> learn by you explaining like I'm five, and this is perfect. I'm just shocked it's actually working. <laughs> Why? Because it's on a Windows PC or? It's on a Windows. Oh, God. For those of you just uh, chiming in, Glenn is our uh, resident Apple lover. That's all right. He learned. <laughs> now, if you're taking notes, go ahead and draw eight lines on your paper like this. So for those of you drawing or actually writing your notes or snip this, either one, eight lines. Now, eight binary bits is also called an octet. And in networking, especially when we dive into like IP addressing, this word octet is going to pop up pretty uh, consistently. So eight binary numbers is one octet. And for the most part, even through like Security Plus, with binary, it's going to be limited to eight numbers. Although this is a numeral system and it goes on forever, eight binary digits will be on the focal point for most IT exams. Now, why do I have these numbers down here? Uh, first of all, it's real easy. The very far right bit starts at one and it just doubles as you move to the left. Now, in reality, not that you have to know this for the exam or anything, but in reality, these numbers just represent the powers of two, because that's what binary does. It just literally counts the powers of two. So like the number one, mathematically, is the same as two to the zeroth power, all the way to two to the seventh power. So that's why those numbers are under here. We, you don't have to do exponents and all that fun stuff, but that's just why the numbers are what they are. 2 to the 0, all the way to 2 to the 7th, and you count how many they are. Now, if we're looking at 
how to actually convert binary. So if I gave you an example of 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And I said, what is this binary number in base 10? Like base 10 being decimal or normal number system, right? Zero means that you don't have this. You don't have a 128 or a 64. The one means that you do have it. So in this case, you have a 32, you have an eight, and you have a two. So this binary number, the ones being placed in the specific places that they are, just means that this is 32 plus eight. What in the hell is this crazy color scheme going on here? It's fancy. Is that visible to everybody? Or is that uh, very distracting? It's quite fancy. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I totally planned that shit. Yeah. <laughs> like just, a gradient. Just, just kidding. <laughs> totally planned it. But the ones being placed where they're at here just means that it's 32 plus 8 plus 2, which would be the number 42. So this eight digit binary number is equal to the normal base 10 number 42. Realistically, if you can write these eight lines and then the numbers beneath them, one, two, four, eight, 16, all the way to 128, if it has a one, you add it. If it has a zero, you don't add it. That's literally all a binary. Does everyone see how I got the number 42? Or do we need any clarification? So it's just turning on or off a number, like a light switch. Exactly, yeah. Exactly right. If there's a one, the light switch is on, you have that number. If there's a zero, you don't have, you don't have it, so you don't add it. Yeah, this is brilliant. Once, once you know, you attach the numbers and realize like the exponential thing, and then know like mechanically how to physically do it. Yeah, it's all you. Brilliant. Really I'll never forget this, <laughs> forever. Like riding a bike. Well, and it's funny. Uh, recently, someone sent me a resource where the instructor was using two to the zero, two to the first, two to the second, two to the third. I'm like, dude, nobody likes exponents. Like why, why, like, why would you default to using, I mean, unless you're like a math nerd, I am not, you know, I, I'm, uh, I know enough math to get by, that's about it, but if, unless you're really uh, into math, there's no reason you need to do any exponent math work on any exam. I think it's just enough to know that that's where it comes from, and then be done with that, and do yeah. it the easy way. Yep. Doesn't this also tie into the whole 32 and 64 bit thing? Wasn't when it was 32, it just went to the 64, and now that it's at 64, it goes to 128, or am I mistaken in that? No, I mean, well, you're talking about like the actual uh, architecture names or the, the end of this octet here? Well, I thought that's why they went to 64, is it added one more line uh, value of exponent. I could be wrong. So the 64-bit and 32-bit architecture, which we will talk about a little bit later, but that that really is just the architecture that allows a certain amount of RAM to be addressed by the processor. So if, if you actually have a true 32-bit system, the, you, you max out at 4 gigabytes of RAM, which is a, a problem, right? <laughs> so, I mean, we will talk about system architecture a little bit later, and it does actually, I mean, well, the entire IT world boils down to this bullet point on the board, not just architecture, but it does relate. But without, without going too far in depth in architecture, yes, it does relate to how many bits of data ultimately can go to from one place to another. <laughs> Love your zeros. Hey, man, those are the best zeros I could do, all right? I, 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 I totally have my brain power to make those zeros. This Manthrills in chat says, do you need to convert from binary to octal or ASCII or hexadecimal on the test um, he means? Is, is there going to be anything with when it comes to octal, ASCII, or hexadecimal? So, on the test? no, no, no octal, which is base 8, or no ASCII. You don't have to memorize ASCII numbers, which is binary to, like, text on your keyboard. So you don't have to memorize or do any of that. And then Fast Chicken is asking, could you answer, uh, excuse me, would this octet technically be compressed from a larger file? I, I'm not too sure on what he's asking on that one. 
Wait a minute. Uh, uh, are you looking at the? Uh, the I'm in. The Dis- Twi- I'm doing both Discord and Twitch. Uh, are you? What, which which channel are you looking at in uh, Discord? Uh, core st- Core One Study Chat. In the live stream chat. The live stream chat. Oh, okay. I was looking at the uh, just the two twenty eleven oh one. Okay. I honestly forget that <laughs> the live streams have their own chat. My bad. Um, so oh, basically what he's. Yeah. Oh, oh, man thrills. Um, you do not have to convert hexadecimal. So don't worry about hexadecimal. E- even in like net plus, you don't have to do any IPv v six conversions. Um, uh, uh, fast chicken. Yeah. What, what do you mean about com- compress from a larger file? Like, do you have to manually calculate compression? Absolutely not. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. So I, I I got eyes on the actual live stream chat now. My my fault, guys. I was wondering where you're getting those questions. All right. Let's go ahead and try. Uh, Try a little bit of uh, practice here. What is this in binary? What number is this? If I had the extra zero there. I'm 36. So a, a few answers in the chat. <laughs> so this being an eight-digit binary number, right? That would mean that we have a one on the one twenty-eight, and we'd have a one on the eight, correct? Yep. So one twenty-eight plus eight, one thirty-six. So just looking at this binary number, that's the 128 spot, that's the 8 spot. So just looking at that, yep, that's the number 136. That's your postcode. <laughs> when you say postcode, do you mean like your mailing postcode or your power on self-test code? <laughs> Sorry, n- nerd joke there. Yes, this is actually pretty important to know, specifically when you get to networking, right? You're going to have to actually use this binary when we talk about subnet masks and CIDR and, and variable link subnet masks. So, no, this is not exact direct test questions. Like, what is this number? Blah. Nope. But you're going to actually have to use this, this knowledge to dive into networking. Yeah, sure. So with this number being 136, right? My fancy writing here. I know, right? It's like, it's like, it's like my actual real handwriting. But remember, when, if there's a 1, that just means that you add that number. You have that number. So up here on this binary chart, we have 8 digits here and 8 digits here. So this number 1 actually correlates to this 128 place marker. This number 1 is on the actual eight spot. The rest of them are zero, so we don't have them. So you would literally just add 128 plus eight to get your 132. Or sorry, 136. That's all it is. Like that's the entire binary. <laughs> if if it has a one, you add it. If it's a zero, you don't add it. There's no uh yeah, there's, there's no nothing else. Yeah, the 128, the 1 through 128, these numbers never change. Yeah, these are a constant. Because remember, they represent the powers of 2. So they will never change. You referenced so, that earlier. Can you write the powers of 2 up there? Just so I... Because it sounds like it's a different nomenclature for the same thing. It, it is a different nomenclature. And I mean, uh, I, I can, but I will also add you don't need to know this specifically. 
You know what I mean? It's like two to the zero, two to the first, because anything to the zero power is one, right? Two to the second, two to the third, two to the fourth, excuse my fantastic handwriting, two to the fifth, two to the sixth, and two to the seventh. All right, I'm going to snip that one second, just for knowledge base completeness. Well, I, I knew I had one math nerd in here that wanted exponents. <laughs> And Sean, while, while he's Sorry, doing that, that under. <laughs> so to, to just to kind of cover on fast chicken, what he's saying in the chat and whatnot, binary, this binary that you're seeing is the basic lowest level that a computer thinks. So when you work with a computer program or music compression or whatnot, what it's doing is it will take one or eight bits or one byte and add to it to whatever you want to do. So for example, if, if, the, if the software is looking for a piece of information, it will go to that byte, those eight bits, determine what that's telling you, that on-off switches, and then it'll go to the next byte and ask, well, okay, what are you doing? Now, it does it millions of times, thousands of times, but this is the lowest level. Don't go too high on compression or anything, but this is the lowest level that a software will get to in in computer terms yeah i mean think of it like the dna right if you write an email the data that is being created in the email is going to be in binary if you send a picture or a video at some point after encryption and decryption and compression and all that fun stuff it's going to be ultimately the data is in binary so this is kind of the dna oh scott i missed the opportunity to put a sweet jurassic park dna put plug in here it's all right. Yeah, you do Next. love your memes, and Next I'm time. surprised that we haven't gotten one yet. I'll stand by. Life just finds a way. <laughs> all right, good questions. Um, actually, a few notes we're also going to add here. Now, uh, uh, some of these notes, like the one I'm about to write, are also there for test-taking purposes. So remember, this test is a timed exam, right? So I always made my students memorize all odd numbers end in a one. In binary, right? All odd numbers end in a one. All even numbers end in a zero. Which makes sense, right? Looking at this binary numeral system, the only odd number, if, you, if you're doubling it to infinity even, the only odd number is this first number one. Now, why am I even bringing this up as a bullet point? Well, if you get a, a test question that involves converting an IP address to binary, like, hey, 192.168, oh, fat fingers, 192.168.11, and each one of these numbers is an eight digit binary number, if you remember these rules, you probably won't even have to do any binary. Like you know the number 192 ends in a zero. You know 168 ends in a zero. One ends in a one, obviously. All, all odd numbers will end in a one. So if you're converting numbers in future questions, if you keep these two bullet points in mind, it'll probably save you a solid amount of time in those questions. Does everybody understand why all even numbers end in a zero, odd numbers end in a one. Yes, because that last number is a one. That's it, and that's the only odd number in the whole numeral system, right? <laughs> I, I, I guess I'm scaring uh, small animals too. You're right, you're right. Not on purpose. All right. Go ahead and uh, snip this if you need it. We're moving on. So, let's talk a little bit about hexadecimal. Now, before you go into full panic mode, you don't have to convert hexadecimal to binary or base 10 or anything like that. You do need to recognize it. So, hexadecimal is base 16. Now, what do we mean by base 16? So our everyday numeral system is base 10, right? Decimal, meaning we have 10 unique characters, zero through nine. So when you go to the bank, 
your bank will only give you these numbers, zero through nine, because that's the only numbers we use, right? Hexadecimal is another very, very core uh, strand of DNA that computer systems will use. So most numbers you encounter will be binary and hexadecimal, sometimes shown in base 10. Now, in green here, we have our normal numbers. In red, we have base 16, meaning zero through nine are the same. But in hexadecimal, you have number seven, number eight, number nine, number A, number B, C, D, E, and F. Of course, this F directly, uh, directly translates to the number 15, A, number 10. Realistically, for most of your exams, you just have to know, hey, if you see a number that has letters in it, it's probably hexadecimal. And later we'll talk about specific addresses that are in hexadecimal. But yes, if it has letters, it's in hexadecimal. If you see an answer that goes above the letter F, you know it is not hexadecimal. If there are no G's or H's or L's in hexadecimal, only A through F. We can go down the rabbit hole of converting these numbers, but it's tedious and most people don't like it and we don't need to do it on the exam. So I'm assuming we just wanna not do that right now, right? If it's not needed. If we don't need it for the test, I don't need it. Yeah, we definitely do not need to convert hex for the test. Even in networking, you don't have to convert hexadecimal. But be aware, zero through F is the range for unique 16 characters in hexadecimal. Uh. All right, again, I'm assuming that most of you uh, have encountered some of these metric prefixes before. Now, before you go uh, panic mode, you don't have to memorize all this trash. Don't worry about that. You will see some familiar ones, though. I'm assuming kilo, mega, giga, maybe even tera, ring a bell to most of you. We've all had a, uh, a gigabyte or megabyte connection or megabyte volume thumb drive. So these metric prefixes are important. Now, remember how Scott earlier said that CompT exams are gonna be obnoxiously precise, right? These are metric prefixes, and we're aware that metric system is based off the number 10, right? But in the IT world, that is not true. So this, these metric prefixes are not based off of the number 10 alone. In IT, it's based off of two to the power of 10. Does anybody know what this is? Just eyeballing all three chats. <laughs> Scott, if I miss the chat, let me know. Yeah. So this is a golden number in the IT world, 1,024. 1,024. You're going to see this pop up a lot. How do we directly apply this? So especially when we get into core two and talk about creating partitions and all that fun stuff, right? Moving between each one of these levels, kilobytes to megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes, we're not moving by a thousand or by any, any base of 10. So how many megabytes are in a gigabyte? 1,024. Not 1,000, 1,024. Because computers work off of binary, as we just discussed, right? So, there are 1,024 kilobytes in a megabyte. 1,024 megabytes in a gigabyte. 1,024 gigabytes in a terabyte. Now, the sad thing is, if you go shopping for a hard drive, right? Let's just say you're, you're going to go buy a four terabyte hard drive. You might actually see on the box 4,000 gigabytes printed. That is not technically correct. That is that is there just for the basic consumer. So don't fall victim to that uh, that marketing crap on the box. 
you do have to know specifically 1024, especially when you start actually creating uh, partitions and logical drives. Uh, so you, you don't get a calculator on the exam, but my advice has always been, if you, if you come across a question that you, you think you need a calculator, you missed something in the question. Go back and reread the question. Because you do not need to do, I mean, there, there's almost zero math on CompT exams. <clears throat> good question, good question so far. All right, moving on. I am going to post this uh, entire whiteboard to Discord. So I know a few people have messaged me about uh, posting that screen. You have the option to actually download this whiteboard and look at it in its entirety. So no stress. I'm assuming you guys would want me to uh, post the whiteboard after I write all my fancy Bob Ross notes on it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if some people like to snip and just have like a, a collection of screenshots, it's up to you. You know, whatever you want to do. I would highly suggest just uh, handwriting notes, but that's just me because I'm old. Another topic that will not be directly on the test. So they're not going to ask you, hey, what are volts? These terms, they're just going to use these terms like within a question and kind of expect you to know what they are, right? The classic volts versus amps. Any uh, any electrical engineer people in here? Yeah. Yeah. A few people working. Yeah. So, oh, we're not doing Ohm's wheel. Thankfully, no more of those. <laughs> I, I saw the Veer equation pop up. Right. So, volts and amps. Uh, I think everybody who has ever taught this has used the water pipe analogy, right? Uh, line and load. Like uh, water with a boat on it. Water with a boat on it? All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that too. So here's a water pipe. A highly detailed 4K rendering realistic water pipe. Now, the big key thing here is volts are defined as the potential for energy. I'm just going to write potential. Where the actual amperage is the flow of electricity. You know where my notes went? Uh, who is uh, who is hot mic in here? Sound like somebody's hot mic and trying to put on a, a windbreaker suit. <laughs> Is everybody else hearing that, or was it just me, Scott? I, I, have, no, I absolutely yeah, heard the windbreaker as well. I'm oh, okay. trying to go through and see who's hot. <laughs> I've got some people server muted, um, if you are trying to talk. Also, if everybody will kind of lower their mic settings, um, I had to do the same thing. Um, that way, you know, we're headphone warnings and everything. All right, try this again. So the voltage is literally just the potential for power, whereas the amps is the actual current that's flowing. So on this diagram here, like if this is a water pipe, the volts might be the width of the pipe. Let's just say this is a four inch thick pipe, right? So if this is a four inch water pipe and it's putting out a gallon a year, is that dangerous? Negative. No, no, not at all. A gallon a year. If this low is a, flow. That's low flow. It's like a gallon a year would be like dripping, right? But if the same exact four inch pipe was putting out three thousand gallons per second, would it be dangerous? Absolutely. Yeah, that'll You'd cut, be cut in half. That'll cut your car in half, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the big key takeaway here is amps. Amps are dangerous to humans. This is the part that will kill you. Volts are dangerous to computer. Meaning like static electricity, which we're about to talk about. 
does this stupid picture <laughs> help us understand the difference between volts and amps? It's great. <laughs> They're very high speed, I know. Yep, I ball in the chest, no questions. So, Just real quick, I had a, a water jet machine where I used to work, and a kid thought that he would want to test the pressure and put his finger under there. Don't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a... That would be like a, testing a 20-amp line by touching it. Dang, there's another Jurassic Park uh, gif I missed. <laughs> the electric fence. A learning experience. I know, man. Next week. I'm disappointed. Next week, there will be some Jurassic Park. I'll make sure they're there. But with volts and amps, there's actually some standardized facts about this. So th these are classic test questions. They've been on CompTIA exams in electrical safety forever, right? How many amps are considered dangerous? So this is the CompTIA 110-100 rule. And really, this is pretty accurate for life in general, not just CompTIA. So one milliamp, the one to 100 rule, one milliamp is when you can actually feel current. 10 milliamps is when you lose muscle control. Uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, you know, uh, we're, the Marine Corps was awesome on safety. So they're like, hey, if there's a wire and you need to test it, make sure you test it with the back of your hand. Because... <laughs> If it's above 10 milliamps and you touch it with the front of your hand, you're not going to be able to let go on your own. <laughs> yeah. 100 milliamps is potentially lethal. Keep in mind, 100 milliamps is 0.1 or a tenth of an amp. It's potentially lethal, you know, depending on where it hits you. So I would be really shocked if you did not encounter what's on the screen right now on your exam. What happens between 10 milliamps and 100 milliamps? I don't know. You piss yourself and pass out. Some kind of, something in between. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And just from dealing with those Delta fans, <laughs> the, the point one will blow out your amp header. Oh. For, your, for your fan, amp, yeah. Your CPU uh, fan header on your motherboard, even though some fans, like the really powerful Delta fans, point, pull 1.4. And so you usually have to figure out a new way to power those. Uh, uh, probably 1.4 milliamps. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, no, true, correct, my bad. Yeah, 1.4 amps would explode your motherboard pretty pretty awesome. Uh, so the 110, good question, Addy, the 110, 100 rule is 1 milliamp, 10 milliamp, 100 milliamps. The, it, me, I, the, the way I think about it, I'm just thinking about it in whole amps. Milliamp, like one milliamp is 0 0.001 amps, are the same thing. But the test will specify milliamps. Good question. Oh, Roz asked a really great question. How many amps is a stun gun? <laughs> no, the CompTIA is going to stick with milliamps. So, really funny uh, situation here. You know, Stun guns, if you go, has anybody here been shopping for a stun gun? Or bought one for somebody or knew someone to have one? Yeah. When, when you see advertisements for stun guns, are they in amps? Or do they say, like, one billion volts? Isn't it usually in volts? Yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, check it out. Go, go research them. They're always in volts. Is volts, are volts dangerous? Or are they the potential for power? Oh, I'm sorry, New York. I'm from Texas. I've got a flamethrower in the garage. <laughs> yeah, the, the voltage doesn't tell you anything about how effective it is. It really doesn't. So... When you do research like a taser, these rules still apply. You can have a million volts if there's no amperage. It's not going. It's a it's a fancy flashlight. Whereas there's a company in Florida that sells um, 
quote unquote less than lethal stun guns and tasers. And their stun guns are going to be point zero three five and above milliamp or amps. So if that company sells point zero three five milliamp stun guns, according to this rule, what will happen if you get hit with a point zero three five amp? You might die. <laughs> you, you shouldn't die. I mean, if you get hit in the like in the they head, they lose it, the muscle control. That's the level you kind of potentially could defecate on yourself. Yeah, the, the, the bad things are going to, that's triple the amount it takes to make you lose muscle control. So the effect, the effectiveness of stun guns and tasers directly relate to this one to one hundred rule, by far. Not death. Nope. <laughs> Does that help us kind of understand what this one to one hundred rule means? Again, these questions have been on CompT exams for the past fifteen years. As I used to call it, how nice. Love it. it. Again, this is like riding a bike or taking a swim. I'll never forget this. <laughs> nice. Seriously. It's my it's Loving my it. high resolution 4K display here, right? This is not a 4K display, for the record. Alright, moving on. A C D C. So just in case uh, you're not aware of these terms, alternating current, direct current. AC comes out of the wall, right? Meaning it actually goes very quickly from negative to positive voltage coming out of the wall. It oscillates in a sinusoidal graph, if you will. DC is a, in a perfect world, it would look like this. It never really looks like this, right? Uh, but AC comes out of the wall. Internal computer components require DC. So most electronics require direct current. That's going to play kind of a big role, especially when we talk about laptops and laptop inverters and other components that have to convert DC back to AC for weird reasons. Um, on that list, we also had two other keywords. So, so we had impedance and resistance. So... Resistance, I think we all know what resistance is in general, right? It opposes the flow of electricity. But in CompTIA world, they're going to specify resistance directly relating to the opposition of DC. Whereas the term that defines the opposition to AC is going to be referred to as impedance. So like later in networking, you, you'll run into issues in, in terms like impedance mismatch, where you have two different types of cables or different sizes of cables connecting data. So impedance resists AC flow, resistance resists DC flow. And of course, I think we have one more word, attenuation. Has anybody heard of this word attenuation before? issues heard oh, of it could not define it i was getting ready to say the same thing but <laughs> not without looking it up with guitar amps yeah yeah blueberry that's actually correct yep so attenuation is just the loss of data or power over distance and we, we've all experienced like wi-fi attenuation when you get too far away from your router right or your access point so the word attenuation literally just describes the loss of power or data over distance. Oh, sorry, had to mute my phone. The loss of data or power over distance. I, I mean, it could be for huge networks, but it, it could also be... Uh, very basic situation right like has anybody ever tried to use like a 200 foot long extension cord <laughs> or a 300 or 400 foot long extension cord it just gets really hot and 
nothing. <laughs> and nothing comes out the other side. Yeah, it'll get hot, and uh, probably, you know, depending on what you're trying to power, if it's a light, you might get away with it, but, like, if you're trying to power an AC unit, that's not happening, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, again, this, uh, they're not going to ask you, hey, what is attenuation, A, B, C, or D? But they might just drop this keyword in there and expect you to kind of know it. I don't think charging cables would be crazy attenuation unless you have like a 30-foot charging cable or something crazy. They do make amplified USB cables where there's an actual amplifier box on the cable with, uh, if for some reason you need to uh, charge your phone from a distance. Attenuation probably applies more to power over Ethernet, I'd imagine, or no? Uh, it definitely uh, applies to it, but uh, attenuation could be for anything. Like, like uh, for example, when we talk about networking cables, like cat cables or Ethernet cables, right? There's already a golden rule of 100 meters because of attenuation. Now, you can buy a 1,000-foot spool of Cat 5e cable, but if you try to plug in each one of those ends, you're not going to get any data through that cable being a thousand foot long because of attenuation. A real world example I had was um, setting up a conference room and they wanted HDMI, be, be able to plug in HDMI on one side of the conference room for the TV on the other. Well, HDMI has a certain distance before it drops off signal. So you have to run it through a box that goes to cat five, then back to basically a um, encryptor and a decryptor. That way you can get distance off of it. So it, it's not just electricity. Well, it's all electricity, but it's not just with uh, data most of the time. It's your uh, cabling. It's o it's always your cabling, but it's not always just Cat5 is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, sorry. I was uh, trying to answer some questions in the chat. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think everybody's freaking out. Like, I need to go buy a shorter phone cable to charge it. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, like, one to ten feet, you're probably going to get the same functionality out of, all right? <laughs> Don't panic too much about the length of the phone cable, guys. I just feel like everybody just had an epiphany, like, I can charge my phone faster. <laughs> no, 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 no. A good way to think about it is, like, I don't know if you guys ever hung up Christmas lights. You can only put so many strands together before they just stop working or you melt something. And yeah. it, I feel like, applies to data or any sort of, basically heat gives you produces power loss or data loss at a certain length or distance yeah no i agree with that you uh if you clark griswold your christmas lights <laughs> like a few younger people might not get that reference but it's all right that was a solid reference solid reference right i thought so it was noteworthy <laughs> all right one one uh power term that we cannot forget and these are questions in the exam, and they're super easy. ESD, or electrostatic discharge. So, amps are dangerous to humans, right? Volts are dangerous to computers. And I don't think a lot of people understand that, like, even, even if you rub your feet on carpet and static shock somebody, that carries a truckload of voltage, right? Or were we aware of that? <laughs> I've, I've seen a kid had his comp his whole PC rig running, RGB lights, everything flashing, peeling off the plastic on his, like, glass case. Static shock fried the whole thing. Yeah. It, well, some components are really sensitive to static shock, like RAM and processor board. You know, all three of those. If you static shock your RAM, it's done, man. I mean, you might as well break it in half. Same thing. But... Like rubbing your feet on carpet and static shocking something. If it's visible, 8,000 volts. In like an office environment with carpet especially, static shock can be up to 35,000 volts. How, how much voltage does it take to kill a PC? 30 volts. So especially if you touch your motherboard and you visibly see a shock, you really hope it went to some low power data bus somewhere and not to uh, a, a key component. 
Now, how do you avoid this? Well, one, don't have carpet anywhere near your computer is my, is my advice. But in a professional environment, you have ESD wrist straps, right? I guess I could have, uh, I guess I could have stolen an image and thrown it on here for you. Sorry, I'm a jerk. Here we go. So you can have ESD wrist straps. So it actually grounds you to whatever device you're working on. Uh, they also make ESD mats that you actually stand on. Or ESD mats for your desktop too. Like to put your computer from its on while you're working on things. Now, when I build my gaming PCs, do I use one of these? No. No, I don't. However, I do make sure I touch a ground. So, for example, your power supply unit, which we're about to talk about shortly, has a ground built into it. So, I mean, is that the textbook correct way that I'm using to build a PC? No. But as long as you ground yourself, as long as you make contact with grounded metal, you can't shock your PC. Now, if I'm at work and I'm, I'm working on a server that's a, you know, a $20,000 machine, yeah, I'll be wearing an ESD wrist strap. Guaranteed. <laughs> like good idea am I explaining this concept of electrostatic discharge well enough you may get two or three questions on this they should be free points what are you able to give us kind of like an example of what an ESD question would be I understand what ESD is I just don't know like how they would ask a question on it I mean Realistically, they, they might say something like, they might give you a troubleshooting scenario, like Bob just installed RAM, or up, upgraded the RAM on his desktop. Before he installed the RAM, he verified to make sure the RAM worked properly. After he installed, the PC won't power on. What's the most likely you know, cause of this failure? Something like that. Or it could say, you know, Bob, was working on a PC standing on a carpet without using an ESD wrist strap. What was the what was the probable cause of the system failure? They might be very blatant about it too, just to make sure you know what ESD is. All right, that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, Addy asked a good question. Do you need to know eight thousand and thirty-five thousand? I don't think so. Those those key bullet points were on like the eight hundred one and early nine hundred one exams. I don't think. Those are bullet points you have to know anymore, if we're being honest. Hey, Sean, so in uh, Twitch chat, we have uh, Luis uh, Feliz12 asking about um, how to go about grounding, if you could kind of give a, a little bit of an example. I think he's thinking more in the ways of, like, if you're building a computer, uh, but as far as, like, carpeted services and whatnot. Yeah, so, like, when you're building a computer, the, the, the go-to way is to wear one of these, like, $2 grounding wrist straps, right? And basically, all it is is a, a, a bracelet that connects your skin with a piece of metal to the skater clip. So you would clip this to something metal that's grounded, like the chassis or the power supply. And when there's metal touching your skin and that metal is grounded, static can't build up on, on, your, on your skin to static shock anything. So you could have one of these on while you're building. And in reference to carpet, I always say carpet because you know, carpet just literally is a sponge for static. That's why in most IT environments, you're not going to find carpet on the ground. It's going to be hardwood or uh, or tile. That's what I meant by the don't build or uh, use your PC on a, on a carpet area. My poor computer. <laughs> Anybody got their desktop like sitting on the carpet so it acts like a little uh, Intel vacuum cleaner? Mine um, at least has some of the feet propped up with a board so that it can get more uh, intake air so it's not sinking into the ground. Uh, that probably helps a lot actually if you have a board underneath it. Just to stop it from it, picking up any static from the carpet. And Sean, I don't, I don't know if I'm going ahead of you, but um, especially with the um, wrist strap, uh, a lot of them will come. I know when I was building computers um, for the pharmacy company, um, we had an electrostatic mat as well that clipped to your wrist strap so that way when you put the chassis down on the mat you be, you 
created a circuit between you and the chassis. That way, you you weren't shocking, you weren't introducing any more electricity into the cha- uh, into the components. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess my fault. We should have probably defined what a ground was. So, if you're not familiar with this term, ground, it's literally just completing a circuit. Like you have a ground in your car. Like so the electrical system from your car has a ground that goes to the chassis or the metal body of the car. So if there's ever a spike in voltage. It doesn't go back into your alternator or anything. It goes into the metal body of your car and dissipates. So a ground is literally just a completion of a circuit that allows any excess to any excess voltage to uh, be redirected away from something important. Uh, good good question. question. When you guys have a um, in like a server room environment, because we had them in our labs, those ESD mats a lot of the times were placed in front of the doorway. So everyone would ground right when they walked into the room, and then the the ESD mat was then what? Uh, screwed in <laughs> to like a ground. Does that not exist in the server space? Uh, I have never. So like everybody walk in and like ground as they walked in the room. I mean, yeah, because I'm uh, referring to like a hydrocarbon lab. Okay. So okay so keep everyone from exploding. All right, so I was going to say, if the, if the room itself was already defined as a clean environment, then yes, that would work. Uh, if, in a server room, yeah, you're not going to see that mat at the front door because if you're touching the servers, especially like like huge rack servers that we have at work, yeah, you, you want to be grounded all the time anyway. <laughs> but in a clean lab, yeah, that would theoretically work if you could verify the variables in the lab weren't changing. Oh, I'm not trying to say no. use one instead of the other. I was just more saying you might see weird grounding stuff in, in the work environment. Well, and, uh, and before you said that, I was thinking, like, you were just grounding, walking into the server room, but then working on the servers. And I was like, oh, no, that, that's probably not the best route. But then you said it was a clean room. Like, okay, that makes a lot more sense, actually. Again, I know a lot of you guys are beyond this knowledge and already have this down, but we have to start from the ground up, uh, given that we have a whole plethora of different uh, knowledge bases here, right? Sean, I remember a CompTIA question that would work with this. Maybe I can throw it to you and you can answer it. Um, yeah. The different ways that electric um, electrostatic discharge can be created. I remember there was a question, um, because a lot of people are thinking carpets. That's their mind. But things like humidity can affect it. Temperature can affect electrostatic. So would you mind kind of going through that? Because I remember there was qu- questions about ways that electrostatic discharge or electrostatic can be gained. Yeah, well, and, and I definitely think it's important to talk about like environmental uh, variables there because that does fall into the CompTIA's question bank, right? Um, the big part is humidity. Your temperature range should be, you know, 60 degrees, 65 degrees. But the humidity, I think, plays a huge part in, in static. And the bullet point that I would remember, which we will talk about later when we talk about environmental monitors, but low humidity, if I can spell correctly, equals high risk of ESD. So you want that humidity to be 50%. You really want it to be about close to 50% as possible. Uh, our server rooms have like fire alarms. Not not fire alarms, but alarms like fire alarms that if humidity or temperature goes out of a, a, a green range, the entire building hears about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so you want the humidity to be really, really, really close to 50% as close to 50% as you can get it. Because eventually the air mass itself can produce static electricity if it's so dry, correct? It can, yeah. Just from moving through the AC ducts and stuff. Yeah. And like, and like our environment, we have environmental monitors, but like the whole building's HVAC isn't static free. Not by a long shot. You know, most places won't be. Good questions rolling in. Good questions all around. Um, so we've been at it for roughly an hour, right? 
normally when I taught class, we take about a five or ten minute break hourly. This is all up to you guys. What would you guys like to do? Is it a ten minute break at you know, an hour or five or ten minute break an hour? Uh, seem uh, seem like it would work. I mean, that's fine. That's fine with me. <laughs> One person you, said, "Keep you going." A break. <laughs> One person said, "Keep going," and everybody's like, "Yes, coffee break." <laughs> well, yeah, so, I'd, I'd love to keep going, but it's it's tough to sit at the computer for hours on end. All right, good questions on break. We're ready to jump back into it. We have a few different terms uh, we need to hit up revolving around power and power safety. And then we're going to move on to the hardware. So we're actually going to break, break the ice on the computer hardware, which would be nice. So many of you have probably used a multimeter before. And for those of you that have not, this is the tool that can measure these four things specifically. So voltage, amperage, resistance. I hope these are, uh, these are terms that you are now familiar with <laughs> from like 30 minutes ago, right? Continuity is a little bit different, right? Does anybody know what that word continuity means? If it's a complete circuit. If it's a complete circuit, very good, right? So continuity is a way to test to see, is this a complete circuit or is this line broken, right? Now the exam questions get, the verbiage get a little bit weird here. So I would go ahead and just randomly define continuity. Well, define continuity as being able to test to see if the circuit is complete. But in order to do that, you set your multimeter to zero ohms. So for those of you not aware, an ohm is a measurement of resistance. So impedance and resistance are measured in ohms which is this fancy little Greek letter if you've ever seen this. That's a terrible letter. That's a little better. So ohms measure resistance and impedance. Now, setting your multimeter to zero ohms. So if you set it to zero ohms, which means zero resistance, that would mean that the line is actually connected. If you hooked it up, I mean your multimeter up to a circuit that had a broken line, well, air is a huge resistor. So you would have more than zero ohms, which would tell you that the line is broken. Not that I'm giving you direct test questions or anything, but this is how you check for continuity by a CompTIA standard. Am I explaining that well enough? <laughs> Nick said, note that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should we have like a, some brevity code? Like stomping on the ground or penguins or something? Can you repeat that one more time as far as there's a few people in the chat that uh, I guess missed it? What, what chat are you looking at? So are you looking at the, uh, the actual Core 1 stream chat? No, no. Yeah, Core 1 study, uh, the stream chat. Uh, intro and... Oh, my fault. Yeah, yeah, it was up there. No, so the continuity, just, just keep in mind that it's in testing. It's testing to make sure that, that a circuit is complete. Like a, a line is not broken, right? The way you do that is you set this multimeter to, to read zero ohms. So zero ohms would mean zero resistance, meaning that it's just a complete connected cable. If you, if you set it to continuity mode or zero ohms on different multimeters and it's more than zero ohms, that means that there's a resistor there. Now, a broken line, air is a heavy, heavy resistor. So if the line is broken, it'll tell you that you do not have continuity. <sighs> so Nice, nice. Good questions. All right, a few more terms. 
that we, we might have already heard it before, but again, you might get these kind of straight up on your uh, COMT exams under electrical power and safety. So, a brownout versus a blackout. I think we've all had blackouts before where power is just gone, right? Interruption of power completely. A brownout is a sag in power. So a brownout is a time period where the power, the voltage actually drops, but doesn't actually get shut off. Compare that to the smaller terms of sag surge, right? A sag is just a time period where there's lower voltage. A surge, obviously, is a spike in voltage. Like if your house gets hit by lightning, you might, uh, you might lose some networking devices. Now, I, I know some of you probably already know this, but a surge suppressor, when you, when you go to the store and you, you buy a power strip slash surge suppressor, there is a difference between a power strip and a surge suppressor, right? That surge suppressor contains a fuse, meaning if the voltage goes above a certain level, that fuse will break and protect your actual components. And usually the price is a good indicator too. You see a, a, a you know a six plug power strip for four dollars. It's probably not a surge suppressor, right? Inland, in yep. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Inland special, yeah. I, I I wouldn't put your new gaming ring on a uh, a four dollar power strip. Now, something that we might not be familiar with. So a UPS, or uninterruptible power supply, I know this is a super detailed slide. This, a UPS is also called a battery backup. So when you see this, this device, a UPS, this acts as a surge suppressor and a giant battery all in one. Now, just from that definition, you know, it has a lot of different uses. Uh, you can plug up a laptop to this and keep it plugged in if you needed to while the power is out. And think of this as a giant battery. Oh, good question, Monique. Yeah, surge suppressor, surge protector, you're going to see those used synonymously, yes. I'm sure there's some electrical engineering nerd that's that's screaming at me right now, but in the CompTIA world, suppressor and protector are used as the same word. <laughs> Good question, good question. So a UPS, uninterruptible un power supply or, or a battery backup, this is used for power redundancy. And we're gonna start throwing some different um, keywords in here. Somebody tell me what that word redundancy means, because you're gonna hear it a lot in this class. Power redundancy. A multiple, a failsafe, a backup? Yeah. I mean, redundancy is literally just, just that. If something is redundant, a duplicate, or multiple, or acting as a backup. Does anybody have that friend that says literally with every sentence? I have one friend like that. I am literally so tired. I literally do this. <laughs> yeah, but every time I hear maybe like oh, five years ago, every time <laughs> every time I hear that word literally, I'm like, that is a really redundant term you're throwing in there for no reason. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> but power redundancy. Now, this also kind of brings up another point, and we're, we're moving into power supplies, so this, that's kind of where we're headed with this. But I'm assuming we've all went and purchased a light bulb before, right? As grown adults, I'm sure we had to buy light bulbs at some point in time. Do you go to the store and buy like a 0.3 milliamp light bulb? Or, or hey, I need, I need a 7 volt light bulb. Is that how you purchase light bulbs? No, right? Mm. Watts. So let's go ahead and um, make sure we're understanding what this term means. So a watt is a definition that defines overall power. 
technically it's volts times amps, volts multiplied by amps. But any computer component you purchase from a power supply to a battery backup to a light bulb, they're all, they're all rated in watts, right? So if my gaming desktop requires 800 watts and I have an 800 watt battery backup, it'll, it'll act as a battery backup for a short period of time. But if I have an 800 watt battery backup and I plug up a, a thin client laptop to it, I can probably power that laptop for hours before I, I need to actually get power back. So the more wattage you have, the more time you have given how much demand you have for whatever you're plugging into it. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Yeah, so a, a thin client is a bare bones PC. By definition, a thin client is a PC that's built with minimum requirements for the operating system. So if the operating system requires two gigs of RAM, that's what a thin client has. Oh no, the NFL memes have started. Is there like a rule of thumb for how big a UPS should be above the size of the PC it's like attached to? Yes, the rule of thumb is as big as you can get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's talk about power supplies real quick. Did you know that was here or was that a lucky guess? That's all right. But honestly, I wasn't kidding. I wasn't kidding. Um, so you definitely want some overhead when you, when you choose a power supply. Now the technical correct answer is right here. So if, if you're trying to figure out how large, uh, how much wattage you need in the power supply, you're supposed to add up all of the actual individual component wattage requirements, and that is your bare minimum power supply. That being said, Anyone who's built a gaming PC in here probably knows better, right? Did anybody who's built a PC actually add up all the power components? You did? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> wow. I mean, you, you can... A lot of honest people were what? lying through their teeth. My components were just so low power that any power supply would have worked. Well, and so in... in if you, if you added all your crap up, right, that's the technical correct way to do it, right? However, I think something it's important to note, right? Check this out. Let's get a little Bob Ross here. Here's a wall outlet. Wait, there, there's a wall plug. Bob Ross. And I want to plug in a floor lamp to it, right? There. Oh, that was a terrible lamp. All right, here's a lamp with one light bulb. That's a light bulb. It might look like a balloon, but it's not. All right, you know what? Fine. We'll do one light bulb lamp. So how much amperage comes out of your wall? John, remember, we have overseas as well, so. Um, it's oh, kind of, I, just kidding. So, <laughs> so Potentially a lot. So voltage, 110 to 120 in the U.S. and Japan, 220. Uh, other places, right? Yeah, Roz, I think you're... I'm not exactly sure what the amperage is, but it's like 15 amps, right? 20 amps for for a uh, an appliance plug, right? But re remember, going back to the power, one-tenth of an amp can kill you. So why do I not have a problem plugging up this floor lamp into a wall that's putting out 15 amps at 110 volts in the U.S.? Well, the wall doesn't throw power into that light bulb, right? This light bulb pulls the power that it needs from the wall. That's why you can plug in a simple lamp with one wire going to one light bulb because the component using electricity will pull the power that it needs. Now, I know this is a, a terrible lamp here, but trust me, it's a lamp. It's a scientific fact. Here, I'll even label it lamp so we're not confused. <laughs> But that light bulb is not going to use even a fraction of the power coming out of the wall. The same thing applies to power supplies or the desktop, right? 
if I if all my system requires 700 watts and I put a 4,000 watt power supply on my computer, that's fine. The components will just pull what they need. So having too much of a power supply, oh, I, I knew someone was going to put it. There's the I love lamp. Well, can I copy that image? <laughs> but your components will pull what they need. So I kind of wasn't kidding. You know, whenever I build a PC, the largest power supply I can get for a good price is what's going in. Or the big, the biggest consumer of power in your system is almost always going to be your video card, your graphics card, or your GPU. We'll talk about those in depth a little bit later. But another great rule of thumb when you're building a gaming PC is, hey, my video card requires 400 watts. I'm looking for an 800 watt plus power supply. Double your video card requirement and you're typically good across the board. So uh, someone asked about the, the bronze and gold and titanium ratings for power supplies. That has to do with like their efficiency rating. Um, it's not something that we have to memorize as a standard because it's not standardized. Oh, Monique actually brought up a really good point. You also want to leave room for growth, right? So if you want to upgrade your PC later, you don't want to already be at the maximum wattage that you can, you can use. That's a very good point. Here we go. By request. <laughs> Uh, is, is everybody still hearing the sound all right? You are loud and clear. You're good on my end, on both Twitch and Discord. All right, so. No worries, no worries. Well, so as uh, someone asked a question, does a higher PSU consume more electricity? So. That's a great point to bring up a, a very CompTIA-esque phrase, right? The power supply does not consume or offer power to the components. So the job of the power supply is to convert power. So a PSU, its job is to convert AC to DC. And the test is going to be kind of obnoxious about that definition of a power supply doesn't pull, use the power, and it doesn't offer the power to the components. It's literally just a relay. The job of this box is to convert AC to DC. <laughs> I knew someone was going to put an AC DC uh, GIF in there. <laughs> Mojo, all right, Mojo is easier. Yeah, but when you were in trouble, you got the whole first, middle, last name too, though, right? I have heard that, and I don't, I'm kind of asking because I'm wondering on verification. The larger the power supply potentially can pull less from the wall because it's kind of like a reservoir in a sense. So as the computer goes under load, it has a larger reservoir in waiting for said load. Um, that may be true, but I don't think, like, the actual capacitance or the capacitors built into the PSU, I don't think that's something that, like, you would see change your power bill. Because ultimately, the amount of energy and wattage used is going to equal the, the total requirements from each component exactly. Now, it might change. You know, if you're on your desktop doing nothing, your GPU might not be using that much power. If you're, you know, if you're playing Assassin's Creed on 4K display, that GPU is going to be pulling a lot more power. So the, 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 the power pool might change depending on how hard you're pushing the hardware, but the capacitance of the actual power supply I don't think is going to be a, a huge variable, if we're being honest. I think that's an important thing to do. You can, if, if your power supply, your PSU is underloaded, meaning that you have a lower one, you could potentially turn your computer on and run Windows just fine, but the moment you turn on a, a 
a game or start really taxing the system, your PSU will go, nope, I don't have enough, shut it down. Yep. And so so just because it's running in a basic Windows setting doesn't mean that it's big enough for what you need. And then you go to Event Viewer and figure out what happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And if you're close to the limit, it'll smell like burning plastic. I've had that. Happen. You you will smell the electric burn. That is a real thing. It's a it's a unique smell, isn't it? Yeah, and the good <laughs> ones will try and put up a fight. The bad power supply is just brick. Um. By the way, I have two pictures of power supplies down here. Anybody notice a difference off the bat? I do. Um. One is modular. Has a modular interface. There we go. That's the term I'm looking for. So the one on the left is not considered modular. Modular meaning you can take off unused cables. So my personal advice, always get go with a modular option if it's in, within your price range. It's not crazy more expensive now. So the, here's an example of a modular power supply where I only have to connect the actual cables that I need to use versus a standard power supply that's non-modular that has all this extra crap to block your airflow, right? Might not be a big deal, but if you have a small chassis, that's definitely a big deal. And not only that, it just collects dust too. So, uh, kind of one of my pet peeves. But on the test, you may see that term modular versus a standard power supply unit. Uh, we'll take a quick pause here. I know I kind of just uh, ranted about power for a second there. Any questions? And I do apologize. I did not have Twitch open. If someone's putting questions in there. So I have it open now. I've been watching Twitch. You're, you've been good on so this. I'm point. terrible at multitasking, man. Sorry. That's why you have mods. That's the exact point of having know. a mod. I think there's... Uh, you can turn the Twitch chat into its own window and I think will it stay over other apps? Let me see. I don't know, will it? I, I saw that pop-out option there. Uh, I can't seem to do it as a viewer. That's alright. I got it uh, Got it off to the side of the, uh, the giant monitor so we're good. The video card fails most likely PSU? Um... I don't think I would generalize like a video card failure as as directly from the power supply. I mean, video cards can video cards can have driver issues, or you can static shock it and kill it. That's definitely a, an option if you don't ground yourself. So there's a lot of failures to video cards that don't have to do with the power supply. Honestly, a lot of driver stuff. <sighs> No other questions before we move on? Hey, I'm rocking a 2070 Super right now, all right? GPU prices are going down, though. So, Roz asked a great question. What, uh, what, what questions could be asked about power supplies, right? Uh, what's in the board right now? The actual function of the power supply, modular, non-modular, or how you technically calculate the wattage. You, you won't actually have to add up anything. The answer will probably just say, you know, a user should add up all of the individual component requirements to have the full wattage for the system. Or, we they will ask more granular details. So let's go ahead and talk about a few of these. The power supply has various connectors that come off of it. Of, off of it. And they have some very specific functions, right? So here's just a quick list I threw up here. We're gonna look at each one of these and kind of talk about what they do um, and some key bullet points we need to know about them. I tried to get the best pictures I could find on the, uh, the internet um, where you can actually see some detail. Bullet point number one. So this is a 24 pin main power supply connector. This is the main power to your motherboard. Uh, 20 slash 24 because it could be 20 pins or 24 but if we look obnoxiously close you notice they're not all square pins 
Some of them are square, some of them are a little bit of a weird uh, six-sided shape, right? And hats. And hats. <laughs> but the test will refer to this as keyed. These are keyed ports, meaning they only fit one way. I know uh, some of you know this, but pretty much every component inside of a PC only fits one way. Like, you got to push real hard to put this in the wrong way. Just being honest. So that these you can't put you can't put any of these in backwards. <laughs> right? So every component is going to be keyed. Now, the wires, here's another issue we run into. Some of these wires carry specific voltages. Oh no. Vladimir, you're open mic and you have a mechanical keyboard? Ah. Uh. Killing me, Smalls. <laughs> I've never had someone comment on that. It's all good. It's I all thought good. it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wait. Do you, do you play uh, games online, open mic with your friends? Because they're really nice. That's true. We play in Call of Duty. <laughs> I'd be like, nope. I mostly play those too. All right. So CompTIA will require you to know some specific color codes and specific voltages. So we have yellow, red, orange, black, and other. So the yellow cable is always going to be 12 volts. Right? The red cable is always going to be 5 volts. Orange will always be exactly 3.3 volts. And the black will always serve as the ground. So are these specific? Yes. Meaning, if you get a test question, don't choose 5.5 or 3.5 or 12.3 or negative 5. The only correct, the only answers you're ever going to choose in a CompTIA test are 12, 5, and 3.3. <laughs> the other cables you don't have to memorize you don't have to memorize what the actual cable colors are because other cables are negative or test voltages so if they ask about a blue cable or a purple cable or anything like that they're going to be negative voltages or test voltages which are not standardized you don't have to worry about those so this is all you have to memorize Now, I understand why CompTIA does this, because if you had to troubleshoot a power supply connector with a multimeter, you could put black on black and your lead on red and make sure it's five volts. If you're working on any kind of hardware, you're gonna have a power supply tester. And a power supply tester is literally just a small, like $5 box you can get on Amazon that lets you test any one of the power supply connectors. Here's a fancy image I totally just drew. Non-copyrighted, don't sue me. But that's what it looks like. It just has plugs for all these different ones. And notice, if you look real close, and hence, there's a green light for 12 volts, five volts, and 3.3 volts. So yes, definitely all testable bullet points on the board right now. Although this isn't the most exciting crap, uh, very, very important when it comes to your A plus test. Any questions about this specifically? I am on board. Tracking? Absolutely tracking. Uh, fair warning, at the end of every class, there's definitely a quiz. 100% a quiz. Uh, speaking of that, it'll be a Kahoot quiz. Scott, do we have more than 100 people? We're close. We are definitely close. Oh, that's all right. I will go... Well, uh, I'd 
I say that, but I see a bunch of people that are in our Discord chat are in the Twitch as well. They're cross-platforming. So I think we'll be all right. I, if, if I were to, and I haven't, but if I were to pull stuff out, um, we're probably at 80 unique users. All right, so I'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and try to run the quiz. It maxes out at 100 people. If people can't get in, I'll, uh, I'll swipe my credit card and buy the upgraded version up to 200 people if I need to. So I think we might be under 100 people, so we'll, we'll be good. And yes, chat, yeah. he loves his quizzes. Yeah. Don't, don't. He, yeah. <laughs> he loves his quizzes. But they're not that bad. Honestly, they're not that bad. Got more quizzes than Blade's Grass. He doesn't do, Sean, the great thing that you do in teaching isn't that you're not trying to confuse people. You're not trying to give quiz questions. I've never seen you give a quiz question that was trying to stump or show that you're more knowledgeable than other people. The quiz questions are very much of, if you're paying attention, go get them. If you're not, you won't. That's simple. Well, well and uh, who was it that sent me the, someone sent me a, a question they got from some resource about what can you use in place of this? And the answer was two eight pins and a four pin. I have never heard of that crap in my entire IT adult life. Um, and I've never seen that on an exam. I don't know what potato would put two eights and a four unless it was a requirement. Um, by standard, that 24 pin slot on the board, which is re it's real easy to actually notice, by the way. Let's go to the motherboard real quick wherever it is, that 24 pin is hard to miss. It's the only I, board that looks like that. I think when I was looking at that in the past, I didn't chat in there. I am pretty sure that that person, and I'm not calling out, so if you are that person, please don't think they were calling you out. I think you were mixing up the power and the CPU. I have seen, you know, a CPU can be an eight pin plus four, but no, no, I, th uh, I think they sent the question. I think I saw the question, and the, the question okay. answer wanted wanted the, the quiz taker to say two eight pins and a four pin would work here for a total of yeah. 20 pins, and I have never, ever seen that done anywhere. So That's playing with The fire. power supply itself wouldn't know to turn on if you did it that way. D yeah, it's just, that's just bad. That's a really bad question that someone found. Not your, not yeah. your guys' fault, but... I would note that even though it's a 24 pin, if it's a low power board, you can use a 20 pin in a 24 pin slot. You can do that. I would also note on this 24 pin main ATX power before we get to the actual board itself, that obviously the difference between the four pins and the tw or the 24 pins and the 20 pin is four pins, right? But these four pins are an entire set of yellow, red, orange, and black. So that may also be something that I would um, note for no reason other than just arbitrary notes, right? The extra four pins from a 20 to a 24 pin are yellow, red, orange, and black, an entire set. All right, moving on to other power supply connectors. So on the right-hand side here, we have a bird, or sorry, left-hand side, we have a bird connector. Four pin bird. Does anybody know what this is used for? It looks like a fan connector, it really does. But looking closely, there's one raised ridge here, right in the middle. And believe it or not, this is used for FDDs. Floppy drives. Yeah, floppy disk drives. For you youngins, that's what the save file looks like. <laughs> So everybody's like, why in the hell would they still use those? They are still heavily in use in some environments. Um, they, they really are, which is we yeah, Oregon Trail, flat out Oregon Trail. So the problem is when you're looking at proprietary devices, like um, th there was an environment that I encountered, they had 
professional quilting machines. So imagine this big plotter printer looking device, right? 20 feet wide, 20 feet long, that would automatically quilt like blankets. Well, I mean, if a company has these big quilting machines, right, that are $250,000 a pop or whatever the hell they are, they only take floppy drive input. So if the machines are that expensive, how long do you think they're going to try to use floppy drives? For as long as they can. So as, happy. As long as they can, right? <laughs> Forever. My wife is... My wife is going to be so happy you brought up quilting in our IT chat. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> but, no, those, those, like, automatic quilting machines are really, really, really expensive. A lot of proprietary devices will only take floppy drive input. So, do I expect anybody to have a floppy drive in their desktop at home? God, I hope not. That would suck, unless it's just for funsies. But they do still exist, and I have seen this four-pin bird pop up on random CompTIA shenanigans. For, I haven't had a DVD or CD ROM in a minute either. This plug on the right, the power supply connector on the right, this is also considered a bit legacy, but it is still heavily used. Anybody know what this one is? The Molex. Now, its original function was to power legacy, which means old, hard drives. PETA slash IDE hard drives, which we have a whole section of hard drive technology to discuss later. So no stress on that yet. But its main job was to power old school hard drives and like old school DVD drives. Or, yeah, it, well really, it powers anything. <laughs> um, notice you have a 12 volt, and a five volt power supply connector. So the great thing about having Molex power connectors is that you can go online and for $2, you can get Molex to any bang adapters for any kind of power supply connector you need. If you need four additional chassis fan connectors, you can get Molex to four three pin chassis fan connectors. So it really is awesome to have a bunch of extra Molex connectors just as you know something as a redundancy in case you need other connectors you don't already have. So even though this is legacy slash old, it's good to have extra. It really is. Called out. Wait, who got called out? What did I miss? Oh, yeah, if you're watching stream and you have a question, we will uh, definitely get it out. That was yeah. <laughs> that was when I typed on my mechanical keyboard. <laughs> oh, it's all good. Moving on, some more modern stuff. So I'm trying to get these, keep these pictures as large as possible will give us still uh, some room to take a few basic notes. Um, some of you, uh, a few of you sent me <laughs> snippets of your textbooks. You don't need to memorize the history of Molex, like the company Molex that makes this, or the history of any of these power supply connectors. So yes, your book might have four paragraphs talking about this. I would suggest just saying, hey, this is a 15 pin SATA power connector. So first of all, define it. Make sure you can define the power supply connector. And just know that this powers modern hard drives. I'll go ahead and write out hard drives. Hard drives and optical drives like DVD, CD, Blu-ray. Base definition, do they power a bunch of other stuff too? Yes, but by base definition, that is their job in life. Uh, yeah, we, we can go up and get uh, we can go we can go up and get the uh, the other pictures. Roz, there is a seven pin, but not off the power supply. So the seven pin SATA connector goes from the hard drive to the motherboard. That's a data, a SATA data cable. That carries information. 
This just carries power from the power supply unit. Vladimir, I told you I think Starlink was a better option. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing any frame drops in the stats either right now. Not yet, Eve, at least. 15 pin saying the power, modern hard drives and optical drives. By the way, this term SATA, Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, not that you have to know that, but it brings up some kind of verbiage tricks to the CompTIA exams. I think we've all heard of these terms, parallel versus serial, like descriptions in general. And you will see these terms kind of projectile vomited all over the IT world. Like, you, you really will. But we've already mentioned, like, PETA drives versus SATA drives. Old PETA versus new SATA. Newer SATA drives. So these terms, as they come up, they're describing data transfer. Parallel data transfer was 8 bits at a time. Old school, kind of like if you remember the old ribbon cables to hard drives. Serial describes one bit of data at a time, like a USB, universal serial bus. So generically, if these are new to you, I would just note that parallel typically describes something legacy or slower, whereas something described as serial is going to be newer and faster, generically. Kind of a kind of some keywords to note there. Yeah, the, these terms parallel and serial describe generic data transfer. So if something is parallel, right? Get a little Bob Ross here. Like old school ribbon cables. It would have like eight lanes of traffic. And it would send waves of bits at a time. The problem was when that old school parallel connection connected to a device like a hard drive, there was a bottleneck there and it slowed down the data transfer. Whereas new data transfer like USB or even fiber cable sends one bit of data at a time. Then they realized that when you send one bit of data at a time, you can go exponentially faster than trying to send eight at a time expecting that device to reorganize the bits into usable data. So when we say serial advanced technology attachment, we know that we're talking about modern hard drives or newer anyway. If you see PETA drives parallel attached, that's old school. So no, hopefully you're not hitting PETA drives anymore, but you might. And on the left side here, we have another power supply connector, a four slash eight pin. Now, uh, I would also note that there's other naming conventions for power supply connectors. Like you might see like P12, P4 naming conventions. CompTIA exams don't typically veer towards those style of naming conventions, even though I know like some cert master crap does if you're studying cert master. So typically it'll say something like a four or eight pin ATX power supply connector. And when we get into the, uh, the motherboards, this will make a lot more sense, but ATX is literally just an acronym that means your standard normal size for motherboards and power supplies. So that term ATX, literally just means your normal or standard size. It stands for Advanced Technology Extended, but we don't care about that. Now the 4 slash 8 pin has an obnoxiously specific role. You're going to see the 4 slash 8 pin near the CPU socket on the motherboard, but CompTIA will define this as the PSU connector that will power the CPU voltage regulator, which is 100% true. Just nobody in IT actually says that. 
So this is kind of one of the things that Scott was referring to earlier. Like, no one's going to say, oh, here's the connector for the PC voltage regulator. Um, <laughs> but that is technically its job. Now, some of you might have also seen this, these eight pins used on graphics cards, and that's 100% true too. So for the eight pins are used on larger cards. The standardized answer to that though is gonna be a six pin graphics card, which we're gonna to get to here in a second. And I know someone asked to go up and get a screenshot of the other connectors, which we will do as well. I feel like when, the, when, when, when there's no activity in the chat, you guys are either taking notes or, uh, <laughs> or uh, getting some, um, some electric burn smell going on in here. Processing solid, solid. I want to go ahead and move up. To the previous pictures, so we can, the so whoever requests them can get snippets of that. So here are there you go. We'll get them all on one page. Go fancy me. This all of those on one page anyway. Drawing connectors, going full Bob Ross, hand drawn. <laughs> 15 pin SATA detail, that'd be awesome. Oops, no connector mistakes, only happy connector accidents. Only happy accidents. All right, and the last two power supply connectors that we're gonna talk about right now. The one on the left is definitely gonna be mentioned on the exam. So this is called the six pin PCIe power connector. And this is your standard go-to for additional graphics card power. Even though in real life, it could be a six or eight pins, bigger cards will take eight pins. But CompTIA standard will define this as the go-to for additional graphics card or video card power. Yeah, I am gonna upload the whiteboard um, with all these random notes and stuff on it, yep. Has anybody seen this monster yet? Negative. Isn't, isn't that the new NVIDIA one? Yeah, so this is the new 12 pin standard. Um, I would note that this is probably not gonna be on the test. I'd be shocked if this is on your CompT exam. But in the real world, this is very interesting. This is kind of the first iteration to a new like power supply connector in a while. I think, like, I think it's been like 2003 was the last major change in like an actual standardized power supply connector. So this is gonna be your 12 pin, your 12 pin or sometimes called a 12 plus four pin, 600 watt graphics card connector. So this is for much newer bigger graphics cards that offers up to 600 watts with a single 12 pin connector well, what could go wrong <laughs> oh. Hmm. oh so uh the pins are are just like the 24 pin they're keyed right so they're not keyed in the exact same way but notice how this one is a different shape than this one meaning you can't put it in backwards, right? You can't actually plug this in backwards unless you put a lot of strength behind it. So uh, all the, the power supply connectors will still remain keyed. Even though it's new, it will still remain keyed. 4090.800 watts, all right. I did read an article recently that the uh say it basically the new 12 pin adapters um pull wattage inconsistently between like the 
the PCI, the, the six, because you can do uh, three six pins into the 12 pin. Yeah. And it'll pull like three to 400 watts off two of the rails instead of all three like it's supposed to. Um, mm. Oh, and, and that goes with my kind of personal theory of buy a trusted name brand power supply. I mean, Corsair power supplies, like you can't go wrong, right? For those of us that have been using Corsair PSUs for 10 plus years or more. Uh, the other thing they were finding yeah. is, you know, on PCI East, they have chained, where you'll have one cable that'll have two connectors, like a, you'll have the connector and then you'll have a jumper to another connector. The, a lot of the newer uh, graphics cards, you need individual PCIe to the power supply for each connection. So you can't use those jumpers. Um, it, it, that's where it's pulling too much and can damage the, P, uh, the PSU. I've actually heard more stable overclocks that way too. Correct. Running two separate cables instead of just one with the jumper. And it, it might sound kind of um, childish, but like when I go to build a PC and I'm looking at like a specific power supply, I'm 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 hunting for that model number on forums, like looking up any any oddities that are involved with that power supply. I mean, that's just something I I, I would suggest, it, especially if you're investing in kind of heavier uh, hardware, more expensive hardware. But someone put in the chat, don't cheap out on a power supply. I agree a hundred percent. You might see a thousand watt, uh, you know, generic power supply for $45 on the shelf. Don't, I, w I wouldn't touch up with a stick, man. Hey, Sean. Uh, Nick Mann is asking what the additional... You asked about the 12 pin plus 4. What is the extra 4 powering sometimes? I have no idea. <laughs> it just comes out. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I only found pictures of 12 pins, but the actual ATX 2.0 standard mentions 12 plus 4, which is weird. So maybe they're getting rid of the plus 4? Because all I found were example of 12 pins. I honestly don't know. Um, we'll see. Again, I don't think it would be on your test, but this is... I mean, I, my power supply doesn't have this. This is brand new. So the first time in 19 years that, it, that you know, ATX or the, the Molex company has released a new standardized power supply connector. Ooh, it's already 10.23. It doesn't feel like we've been here for two and a half hours. This is a uh, kind of flying by. We ready for a, a coffee break? Real Absolutely. quick, I've got one. Sorry, real quick, I've got one from uh, Twitch. Sure. For the twelve-pin connector. Is there a reason the wires don't seem colored according to the earlier scheme? Oh, that's a good question. So, the the standardized colors. Are, are standardized, but a lot of power supplies are non-standard. Like my entire power supply and all the cables are all white. So even though CompTIA and pretty much every other IT industry kind of uh, standardizes those colors, you can definitely buy all black or all white or non-standard power supplies. Hence the, the reason that I always suggest using a power supply tester instead of relying on the colors. But you got to memorize them for the test. Good question. Very good question from, uh, from Twitch. So intro the Daisy PCIe's. They are they are more designed to be modular for lower level uh, GPUs. That was back when GPUs didn't need five, six, seven hundred you know, watts. Um, so you were able to expand. It, it's kind of like on the CPU where some CPU mother, um, the connector on the motherboard will need uh, a specific amount. Whereas that wire, those wires, the daisy chain wire can only pull, it's only rated to pull so much. And so if you're expecting your GPU to use the daisy chain, it's it's not going to be able to pull as much and, it, and you're going to be undervolting hard and it's not you know sometimes you want to undervolt on a gpu to get the best if you're overclocking um but it it most cases you don't that's why like for example the 3000 series you want to be using three specific individual p 
PCIe's because you're it's each port, uh, each connector needs to draw a specific amount to keep it running. I I know like I, I told you guys this time these four hours would fly by. I mean it really will. So I'm really wanting to get all of the processor technology talked about today before we hit our quiz. Next next Saturday we'll have a uh, we'll have plenty of time for RAM, hard drive and RAID technology, expansion cards, and then move on to other like laptop hardware to kind of wrap up all the hardware. Um, so we're making good pace. So before we get into the fun motherboard specifications, those metric prefixes are coming up again, right? Now, the, the, a big key here to know is, honestly, your standard ATX is your normal size motherboard. Uh, I've seen a few resources that kind of define these by exact measurements. Like a micro ATX is 9.3 inches by 8 inches. Has anybody seen that in, in your studies? Please don't waste time memorizing that. Like it, it, it really looks, yeah, you don't, I, I couldn't tell you what the exact me measurements are. You do not have to memorize that for any CompTIA exam. It kind of pisses me off that so many study resources put it in there as if you have to memorize it. So do not memorize, yeah, delete that flashcard, please. <laughs> the exact inches or millimeters or whatever the hell they have it as. Um, what you do have to know, ATX is your standard. And you have a micro ATX, which is a little bit smaller. Now, below ATX, you have your ITX series, Mini, Nano, Pico ITX. And later we'll talk about like Raspberry Pis and systems on a chip and some SCADA networking environments that might use these more in depth, right? But for, for our base knowledge of hardware, ATX, your standard size, has standard mounting holes in it, right? So there's specific places where you'll mount this motherboard to your chassis. ATX and ITX do not share the same mounting holes. So if you're purchasing a, a mini ITX motherboard, you may have issues mounting it into an ATX chassis because these mounting holes will not line up. So general rule of thumb, if, if you're building a standard ATX computer, ATX motherboard, ATX power supply, ATX chassis. It should all match. Whereas if you're buying an ITX motherboard, you need to look for a small form factor or an ITX chassis specifically. Kind of interesting. Any questions on your standardized motherboard form factors? There is an E-ATX, which is bigger. Uh, I haven't seen that on an exam in quite a while, to be honest. So if you're building a PC that where you need three graphics cards and uh, you know two Tesla cards, you'd have to go with E-ATX. But standard, it's ATX. I mean, ITX can be used if you're specifically designing, a, a, you specifically need like a small form factor, a physically small computer, right? And a, a later we'll talk about thin clients and how thin clients relate to like a virtual desktop infrastructure where a thin client basically acts like a relay to a, a connection to a virtualized operating system or even like a media server, right? Media servers are great, you know, great options for like a small small motherboard PC. I mean, realistically, if you're hooking up, if you're building a computer just to hook up to a TV to stream video, you do not need a full ATX. I mean, you can go buy a Raspberry Pi and stream high def video to a TV. I've seen people get Raspberry Pis, which are Pico ITX boards, basically, and actually connect them to the back of the TV. Now, uh, so with mobile devices like cell phones, keep in mind that they don't use these form factors. These form factors are specifically for standardized motherboard sizes for desktops. Yeah, 
So that, that's actually a really good point. Don't confuse those two terms or those two usages. It's so like your cell phone is your cell phone might be the size, but it's not defined as a Pico ITX motherboard. That's going to be a, a proprietary PCB inside built for whatever phone that is. Oh, sorry, I just saw the 12 pin connector question in Discord or uh, in Twitch. I think we got to answer it though, right? Yeah, we did get that answered. And Pandora, great question on that. And Android Box, Android is just an operating system. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, it can use any form factor. Um, most of the time, Android, when you hear that, it's going to be a custom PCB, meaning a, a custom motherboard. Yeah, and Android will be uh, more found in our mobile device or MDM, mobile device management kind of chapter. So no stress there. But I would note that these do not apply to mobile devices. So no one's going to describe any Android device as a Pico ITX phone or anything crazy like that. I'm assuming we're all referencing legally downloaded movies. Let me show my U-Torrent icon. Of course. The icon's not on the desktop. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Legally downloaded only, yeah. I'm not a cop. All right. <laughs> Any questions on these? Let's move on. To our motherboard. So here's how I usually do this in class. And I think students liked it better than having a PowerPoint slide for every component. What we're going to do is we're going to go around this, this board and define each part. But as we come across main components, like your processor and RAM, hard drives, expansion cards, we'll branch away from this motherboard and talk about all of the, uh, the technology associated with those really core components. Sound like a plan? Plan, plan, plan. All right, the first component is actually, I, so I put a side view because you can't really see it from the top down view. Does anybody know what these this interface on the back of your computer is called? Oh, um, you mean like all the ports? Yeah, so this is called the IO, the input output. Yeah. Now, what's really awesome is uh, so the back of this motherboard component, right, is what you actually see on the back of the desktop. But it's not standardized, meaning some motherboards might have 12 USB ports here. Some motherboards might not. Uh, notice this one has a PS2 port, the purple and green port for legacy mouse and keyboard. Some motherboards do not have that. So you don't have to memorize which ports are on the back. Now there is a whole section in the objective list that talks about like the different connector types, right? And we are going to go over Ethernet, CAT cables, all the USB types, USB-C, Thunderbolt, all those kind of ports. Um, I'm going to try to get like a nice little cheat sheet to put all those, you know, what does it look like? What is its function on one whiteboard? just so there's no confusion there. So, you know, forgive me if we just skip over this because we are going to right now, but we're going to cover the details of the external interfaces in kind of a, a more uh, more organized fashion than saying, oh, by the way, here's USB, you know, 1.1, 2, 3, 3.1, 3.2 speeds and what they're used for. Now, I would also note, and we're going to go down, I think I got a picture of a janky desktop down here somewhere. But yeah, it is. I don't know why it's so far down here. But notice on the back of this computer, this is the, this is the I.O. that you see on the motherboard, right? It's important that you know when you start opening a computer to fix it, that you open the side opposite of the I.O. So some, some chassis are pretty clear, while others won't be as easy. But if you're trying to figure out how to open a computer for the first time, 
you can always locate this IO, the input output, and the side opposite that is what you would open to actually repair it. And I'm gonna go ahead and type that out because it's totally not a heavy bullet point in a CompTIA question or anything. There you go. Oh wait, I can change the text color. Man, look at me go. It's not pink, it's salmon. Grown up before our eyes. <laughs> I know, right? So to open a computer, you always open the side opposite the I.O. Yeah, the side panel, yep. Which, I mean, like in a big square chassis, right? It's, um, it's pretty blatant which side you'd open if you're if and when you get familiar with the actual uh, motherboard itself and also in a server environment a server will open at the top so if you look at the io on the back it will be flush or flat on the bottom and you will open up the top so it, just because it's a side panel doesn't mean that it's all side panels or for example in the itx or those mini type computers the whole shell might come off where it's three sides that come off and the bottom is what everything bolts to. Or so, if you're uh, if you're real motivated, you might come across something like this. Yeah, there it is. There you I'm go. About to come up with that. Yeah. So I mean, then you're looking at if there were chassis panels in this, what would you open or how would you start working on it? Um, they have so a this Gundam one, one that I want. Yeah, that one's pretty sweet. <laughs> so this is also a computer case. It just doesn't look like your standard textbook uh, brick. We'll get into that. We have to talk about gaming PCs in depth later. It's kind of a, actually an important topic. Do I have any questions about the I.O.? I wonder why my pictures keep getting um, mutilated and mixed up. My fault, guys. All right, the next component Looking closely, we already know what this one is, right? That's the 4 slash 8 pin, or in this case, a whole 8 pin and a whole 4 pin. What does it directly power? Uh, so Curveball, if you get a question like that in the exam, the acronym CPU might be in three answers. <laughs> what does it specifically power? There you go, the CPU voltage regulator. <laughs> That's all right. It's 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 like like Scott said it's a weird verbiage, right? No one's going to say that in your IT job. On the exam, right next to the CPU socket, you have your CPU voltage regulator. Super important. Yes, in a nutshell, it adds more power to the CPU socket and all these capacitors running alongside of it. But <laughs> hey, bro, what kind of CPU voltage regulator you got? <laughs> Roz, I can't give you direct test questions, but if I had to guess. I bet that description would be in there. Let me just politically correct him up. And I lost Twitch. Any questions I missed? No, okay, cool. No, you're doing good. All right. I told you, man, I'm, a, I'm all over the place when it comes to my, my tabs. I love WAMP keeps coming up first. I don't know why. See, Ryo uh, asked if uh, if there what was the reason to open the side panel opposite of the I/O again. So you open the the side panel opposite the I/O to begin working on a computer. In reality, when we're looking at the opposite of the I/O, you know, e even when you're building or working on a computer, here's the side you would open. This side also opens behind the motherboard. 
And when you start building clean systems, like with clean cable management, you can run most of your SATA and power cables behind the motherboard to make sure they're not in front of the board, inhibiting airflow. Yeah, yeah. If you open this the side, the same side as the I/O, you can't access the actual components themselves. You'd be looking at the back side of the motherboard. So yeah, some of them have solid state uh, mounts back there. Yep. And this whiteboard is just all kinds of crazy today. So, I'll make sure it's clean before I post it. No overlapping pictures or anything. Good questions. Good questions. All right, up here on the top of the board, if we zoom in, thankfully this is a high res picture, we have CPU fan connectors. Now, some important bullet points. Most chassis fans, and when I say chassis fans, we're talking about the fans that are in the case of the computer, right? So if you have like three fans on the front of the case of your computer, those are chassis fans. Most of those chassis fans are powered by three pin connectors. The CPU fan, one or two, if you have multiple, has four pins. This fourth pin is power, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a power regulator. Meaning, this pin is the one that sends the data that tells your computer, or tells your fan, hey, we're getting hotter. Increase the RPMs of the fans. Or when your computer cools down, it decreases the RPMs of your fans. This is the controller pin. Oh, good question. Where would you connect the all-in-one water cooler? Which we're about to talk about coolers, um, but it really depends. So a lot of newer boards have an, all, an actual AIO port on them. Like my board actually uh, has an AIO port on it. Uh, on this board, I'm not sure. Actually, if I'm being honest, I'm not sure where it's at on this board, but it definitely has one. Um, or depending on your, your all-in-one cooler, it could tell you to use certain um, certain like other CPU fan ports just for, just for the fans of the cooler itself. I believe it's right above the M.2 and the heatsink for the I/O. Is it down here? Cor look in the corner. See where yeah, M.2 yep, is. Yep, there it is, right there. So you see how it has actually it looks like it looks exactly like the CPU fan, but it's actually marked AIO pump, which it's not standard location because my AIO pump is actually up here to the right hand side on my motherboard so it's close to the cpu so it, it won't always be right below the processor of course general rule right when, whenever you're building a pc anyway you're going to have that motherboard documentation open even if you built hundreds of pcs you should still have that motherboard documentation open yep <laughs> So, not that it's a direct test question or anything, but what is this fourth pin used for on a CPU fan? Yep, that is your controller pin, right? Power management to the fan. Before we jump into the CPU, and sockets. Do I have any questions? Throw them out there now. We're making good time. About 25 more minutes of this kind of a lecture, if you'll call it, and then about 30 minutes for our quiz slash competition. Yeah, it controls the fan speed. Yep. Well, and if you've ever had like a desktop computer and you notice it's getting hotter, you can hear the fans like start sounding like a vacuum cleaner, right? That's that controller pin telling the fans to go faster. Yep. It reminds me of when I have my old NVIDIA 460 graphics card and I tried to play Dying Light on it. I overclocked it and then it exploded. It didn't, didn't, didn't work too well. I mean, it worked well for a minute. <laughs> yep. All 
right, let's talk about the CPU, right? The processor itself. So on the board, you see the CPU socket, right? Now, general rule, the motherboard will have a socket size identified by a number. And we're going to talk about Intel versus AMD in a second. The socket size has to match the processor. Sorry, one second, my dog's one second over here. Are right, you knock it off? He's doing that. I'll, uh, I'll cover the intro. The purpose of overclocking intro, um, you asked what's the purpose of overclocking, is that every company that designs um, CPUs, graphics cards, uh, RAM, really anything that plugs into a computer, they develop headroom, meaning that, that there is a margin of error that they don't want to push their design to go any further because they want it to last the longest. So what overclocking does is you are then taking their component and pushing it further than what they either recommend or uh, advertise. So for example, a graphics card, they want to get, you know, NVIDIA or AMD wants you to get the longest life out of their component, but you can use certain things like Afterburner or other programs to say, I want to give it a little bit more voltage or a little bit less voltage. I want it to spool up faster. I want the fans to run longer because a GPU that's cool runs better, but a GPU that uh, fans are running all the time is very loud. So it is you being able to dedicate a component to do more than what the original specs are designed to do. Yeah, talking about, yeah so <laughs> the cats always win, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, Maine Coon Cat in a black lab. It was a WWF in the living room. It's fine. Uh, my bad. So we will get to overclocking here in a second. Increasing that uh, manufacturer refresh of the core clock speed and execution units, right? But let's rewind first. A few acronyms, and we're going to write a solid amount of notes on this little board. I'm going to try to keep it as clean as possible. Oh, live stream the animal fights? <laughs> no one, no one wants to watch a Twitch of my cat beating the crap out of my 70 pound dog. All right. No, well, no. that's our pay, that's a pay per view event. That's a pay per view. Yeah. That's a TOS. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> All right, looking closely, LGA versus PGA. So LGA stands for Land Grid Array. PGA stands for Pin Grid Array. Can you visualize the difference? PGA has pins. LGA has landing pads, right? Now, generally, PGA will be used by AMD while LGA will be used by Intel. Are there exceptions? Yes, but generally PGA is AMD. Now, that being said, Intel and AMD have their own socket naming conventions. And here's, a, here's another one of those, hey, don't memorize this, right? But just looking at some of the Intel sockets, you're gonna notice a pattern. Like they had uh, 775, they had 1366, 1156, 1155, then 1151, skipping that 1150. Uh, what are the new ones? We got uh, 2066. We have the server 3647. Uh, and then we have the new 1200 and 1700. So you don't have to memorize these socket numbers anymore. Back in old school A+, plus, they would ask you specifics, not anymore. AMD has kind of a different naming convention. So AMD, you might see FM, FM2, AM2, AM3, AM3+, plus, AM4, AM5 now as of 2022. So Which Sean was just announced to go to LGA. Do it. AM5 is going to LGA. It was announced <laughs> this year. 
<laughs> they're probably tired of people breaking the pins, getting pissed off at the manufacturer. Nope. Um, <laughs> but generally, until that's everywhere, yeah. Now, yes, should you be able to look at these and kind of just recognize, oh, that's AMD and that's Intel? It's pretty easy, right? Intel is a, typically a four-digit number. So if you buy an Intel i7, that's 1155 socket, you better buy an 1155 motherboard. Or a 2066 or a 1200. I think our, this board is one of the 1700 ones, right? Yeah, LGA 1700. So a little bit newer of a socket. Now there are some certain there are certain terms too that you're going to find on your A plus. CompTIA loves to ask about server specifics, like which one is a server chip. So Intel's server chip is called a Xeon processor. AMD's Xeon chip. Or not Xeon chip, a server chip is called Epic. Now, you will see some code names for architecture. So, like, and I have seen people build servers with like Threadripper processors, which is one of AMD's. Um, so, kind of the general rule of thumb is uh, if it sounds like a 1980s wrestler, it's probably an AMD socket or AMD architecture. So, Ryzen, Threadripper. Pile driver, all of those are AMD architectures. <laughs> it's it's dumb, but it's true. Whereas Intel, if it's a bridge or a lake, it's going to be Intel. <laughs> like Sandy Bridge, um, was oh, Alder Lake is a newer one. Yeah. Um, so if it's a cheesy '80s wrestler, it's an AMD. Uh, AMD architecture, if it's a bridge or a lake, it's going to be an Intel architecture. Do we have to memorize these socket numbers? Somebody please say no. No. All right. Very good. All of them. All of them. Sandy Bridge was awesome, man. That was a game changer. Now, with processors, there's a few different terms I want to kind of talk about. And you know, looking at the objective list, um, where, where, did that key, where did those key, key terms go I have here? They're, they're down there. Okay. Fantastic. With processors, you want to hear about cache levels, right? Now, if you don't know what a cache is, a cache is almost like a register built onto a, a, a processor, a small, fast piece of memory. Not that you save anything on it, it's solely used just for the processor. But this communication path between the processor and your main memory, which is your RAM, this is generically referred to as the FSB or front side bus. That connection between processor and RAM is considered the front side bus. Now, there's different little caches of high speed memory. In between that, the L1 is going to be your fastest but smallest volume, whereas L3 will be your slowest. Oh crap, they already had them written there. Good me. <laughs> but it'll be your slowest but further away from the actual CPU execution units, also known as cores, right? So classically, like old school exams. They would say L1 and L2 are on the processor and L3 is on the board. That's old school. Now, it depends. Sometimes you'll find L3 caches on the board. Some bigger processors, you'll have all three of these on the CPU. So now it really depends, meaning it's not standardized anymore. What you do have to know is L1, faster but smaller volume. L3, slower but larger volume all breaking up this communication pathway known as the front side bus connection. By the way, if you hear that term bus, like you're going to hear bus everything, right? A bus is just a connection. That's, a, that's all that term bus means. It's a connection on the motherboard. Uh, 
Am I explaining that well enough? I am so with it. Addy, did that answer your question as far as the FSB broken down into cash? Yeah, I mean... Now, does that still hold true for these newer CPUs? I'm, I'd hate to bring up Mac again, but to like the M1 and the M2 chip, because undoubtedly Intel and AMD are going to follow suit eventually. Uh, I, I'm not sure, because every time I talk about Apple products, I break out in the hives and start itching. There's nothing new. Wow, that sounds like a PC. <laughs> it's it's, it's ARM-based. It's it, No. Yeah, so... one is ARM-based. They've been using ARM chips and cell phones and small integrated circuits for 20 years now yeah there's literally so, nothing new about it so we, well i'm saying is, is is that like the the same l1 l2 l3 like i i, I don't really know much about uh arm chips is that still hold true so yes right there, yeah. so we have to talk about arm chips very briefly but keep in mind when, when you bring up apple right who makes apple's hardware samsung <laughs> Well, I mean, if it's a higher-end Apple, it might have a Samsung board, but uh, Foxconn is typically the cheap Chinese producer of Apple motherboards. So it, it's still Apple is still a standardized motherboard. It still has level 1, 2, and 3 cache between processor and RAM. It's just the architecture you're referring to with the M1 is this, this advanced risk machine, which was typically used as a processor in mobile devices. And, and more like system on a chip and, and proprietary things. So um, everything we've talked about so far is not Windows. This is all standardized hardware. Okay, so and that, and that goes into mobile as well. So they all work with L1, L2, L3. There's um, nothing that changes. Well, I'm, I'm desktop motherboards is what this is referring to. Okay. Samsung makes the Apple. Thing, yeah, yeah. The only thing new in cash is um, 3D cash, which Ryzen's been doing. There is some chiclet design, but that's still on top of the chips that already are there. Yeah, and and thankfully, it, that, that's not standardized yet because it has to be like used in a certain percentage of the enterprise environment to be standardized. So I don't think we're going to see that for for a hot minute. Yeah, and this goes back to remember, there's there's real world application, and then what CompTIA is trying to learn. Don't go into the test and go, well, Apple does it this way, or what I've seen just try to remember again that's not telling you not to think that way but it's just you're studying for a test think in that mode <laughs> i mean i went in there and i'm like wait i have to take this test on the pc I i'm sorry i'm out of here i'm done <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's differentiate these two terms multi cpu versus multi core do not confuse these terms so this is a generic motherboard for a server, right? So multiple processor sockets and a truck ton of RAM is a clear flag that this is a server motherboard. So this will be a multiple CPU where you actually have four Xeon processors or something like that. Um, I know that the main virtual environment that I access at work has four Xeons at three gigahertz. I think it has like 512 gigs of RAM just on that that one resource yeah you can you can load so many virtual machines but we'll get the virtual machines later if we're not sure what those are but when you see multiple cpu that is a clear sign that you're going to have epic or xeon processors on this board right multi-core multi-cpu well, let's talk about what that core is because we have to talk about that literally i just wrote these this is the objective list by the way the last thing I want to cover for today is these last terms in the objective list. But multi-CPU versus multi-core. So well, let's go back to uh, some of the old school, the Intel 8083, right? So with multi-core, the initial processors had one processor and one core. Uh, let's go ahead and make a legend for our little map here. Here. That's a CPU core. So we're not confused, right? It's a happy little core, right? <laughs> so originally processors had one processor, one core. 
And that that core could actually take. Hey, there's my colors. I'm an idiot. All right, that core could take one request and one output per clock cycle. So when we talk about clock cycles, processors are measured in gigahertz. Right? So uh, what, what's my processor at right now? Control Shift Escape. Let's bring up Task Manager. So I have a 32 core processor rocking at 3.8 gigahertz. So each core is refreshing 3.8 billion times per second and each one of those cores originally would take one set of instructions in and one set of instructions out right however of course they then started adding multiple cores right so now we have one CPU with let's just let's just use a dual core example Here's two cores, two, two happy little execution units, right? So now we're looking at a processor that every refresh, it can take one set of instructions in, one set of instructions out per core. So that's a multi-core processor. Now, looking back at my processor, I do not have 32 physical cores in this processor. This is a 16 core processor. 16 physical cores. So why the hell? <laughs> I'll copy and paste 32 smiley faces. <laughs> but hold on, I don't have 32 though. I have 16 physical cores or execution units on this processor, right? So why is it showing 32? Well, these a few key terms oops, came up when it comes to multi-threading. So when we talk about multi-threading, Intel it's called hyper-threading, AMD simultaneous multi-threading. So hyper-threading, I would note, is an Intel-specific word. But hyper-threading means that, you know what, they took this idea, I know this is a dumb picture, but bear with me, right? And we're gonna enable this processor to take in two streams of data per clock cycle and put out two streams of data or two requests per clock cycle. So that's ultimately what multi or hyper threading is or AMD simultaneous multi threading. Each core can take in two sets of instructions per refresh and put out two sets of instructions per refresh. Now, that being said, what, it, what the system views, so if this were my system, I have two physical cores, but the system views, that was terrible. If you, it, it can see the two physical cores, right? But then it also views two virtual or software-based cores. So whenever you see this term virtual, that means software-based in the IT world. So the system, like my system that sees 32 cores on my 64, or on my 16 core processor, it sees double the amount because it's taking two threads of data in at a time. So make sure you're aware that this is what that term virtual core or logical core actually means. I know this is a goofy, barney looking picture, but does that help us understand what hyper-threading and what virtual cores are? Hey, if you're on Windows, go ahead and push Control-Shift-Escape. Pop up your task manager and hit performance. So you might see overall just one graph. If you right click, you can go to change graph to logical software-based processors. So at the top it says, hey, 16 core, and it shows all 32. 16 are physically real, 16 are software-based because Windows is like, hey, this computer can take 32 sets of instructions in, 
32 sets of instructions out per refresh. Also note at the bottom here, it tells you if virtualization is enabled, which we'll talk about virtualization a lot later, but your CPU ultimately determines whether you can do virtualization. So it tells you if it's enabled and it tells you your L1, L2, and L3 cache. So right now I got 64 megabytes of L3 and one megabyte of L1. Yeah, realistically, the more cores, this means you're multitasking more. So, like, when, when I'm playing, uh, you know, a video game, if I'm playing Call of Duty, it's not using all 32 cores, not even 16, not even 8. <laughs> it's, it's not. You know, when I'm gaming, it's using a small number of cores. Does this help visualize and understand what, what these terms actually mean? Because you will see these in the exam. Nice, cool. That's the first time I see several people are typing. Not, not even names anymore. <laughs> All right, do we, do we forget any terms from the objective list? So virtualization support, literally for now, just know that the processor has to support virtualization. I only bring up this ARM CPU because one, on the, on the 1001, it wasn't really an objective. It was added on the 1101 and from our Apple enthusiast, we probably know why now, right? So ARM CPUs, again, were used more so in, in mobile devices than anything. And actually, ARM is is not a company, right? ARM is who owns the actual the actual architecture. So ARM will sell companies like Apple the base architecture to build their own their own actual hardware on. So when Apple wanted to build their M1 processor to somehow compete with Intel and AMD which I don't think they will, in real power, they had to purchase the architecture from ARM and then they built their M1 as an ARM-based processor. We'll talk more about ARM CPUs, especially uh, when we get into more proprietary like system-on-the-chip conversations. Uh, are, you, are you guys still playing around here in your task manager? <laughs> yep, maybe. You feel like a mad scientist with all those moving graphs and fancy numbers and whatnot. And and honestly, as we get through A plus, you wanna you wanna start realizing, you know what? Um, I know what most of this means. You wanna start really understanding. I mean. I hope you don't have this many Ethernet adapters, but you'll start seeing all these specifications and really actually understanding what it means. Uh, run off hardware cores? Yeah, yeah I mean, well, it, it's the virtual cores are just there because the operating system sees a core doing two things at one time. So like Windows is like, hey, that one core is taking in two jobs at a time. It must be two cores. So it sees a physical core and a virtual core from the point of view of the operating system. Now, is that a uh, severe oversimplification? Yes. Yes, it is. Is that more than you need to know for an A-plus exam? Yes, it is. You can go 25 pages deep on Wikipedia on the details, but I wouldn't suggest it. Now, the last bullet point here I want to talk about before our quiz. Oh, I have a fancy picture for it. 
So, x64 versus x86. So, 64-bit architecture versus 32-bit architecture. Um, so, one, 32 bits is always described as x86, which is really annoying, but that has to do with the, uh, the Intel 8086 series or the 80386 earlier processors, the first wave of 32-bit processors. Is this important to know? Yes, because like when we get to core two, you want to realize that you have program files and program files x86. Or we have um, system files. Has anybody ever messed around with their system files? You don't have to write this one down. This is core two, but we have system 32, which is your 64-bit system files. And you have syswow64. which are your 32-bit system files. SysWow means System Windows 32 on Windows 64. So you're going to need to know this for Core 1 and Core 2. Core 2, the system files specifically, but that's just kind of a good example of how Core 1 heavily overlaps Core 2. So um, do you have to know the naming conventions like i7, specific generations like 12th gen 10th gen no uh, there's another section called custom configurations so we have to kind of zero in on what type of hardware you use for a cad cam machine or audio video editing or gaming pc um, so there we're going to talk about intel's like i3 i5 i7 i9 versus the ryzen or other amd options um, so you don't have to like memorize any of the actual naming conventions, but we are going to accidentally talk about them just because we're going to talk about specific hardware. So I, I guess in a, a political response, we're going to talk about them, but not because you have to memorize them for the test. We're just going to talk about them as we talk about hardware. I'm well, sorry, I feel like I've been ranting for like an hour straight. That's all I got for you for processors and and your uh, your intro basics. Do I have any questions before your quiz? Oh, not in not in a class. We got a quiz. Did you mean to write thirty two bits is always as x eighty six and not x sixty four? Yeah, uh, no, x86 is, is 32 bits. Oh. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, 64 bits will be x64. It's actually, did I put it down here? Ah, just architecture. I only put this here because I like the little Mortal Kombat symbol. I'm not going to lie. Do we, uh, do we feel like we're drinking from a fire hose today? A little bit? So the, technically the program files when they say x86, that's actually all the legacy stuff when that's left over from 32-bit? No, I mean a lot of programs are still written in 32-bit architecture. Okay. Like, like uh, if I go into my, 32, my x86 program files, I mean I still have uh, a decent amount of uh, like Call of Duty Modern Warfare is in my my 32 bit. Like, actually, Black Ops and Modern Warfare are in there. So modern programs can be written in 32 bit architecture. So I, I wouldn't say they're it's exactly legacy. You know what I mean? Engineers are trash at naming things. That's a fact. Hypervisor. Okay, so see for, for now, just we'll talk about virtualization a little bit later. But there are some like Intel specific or Microsoft specific hypervisors 
like Hyper V, but not that we have to go into detail because there's you know, in the real world. I mean, in my experience, you're not going to be using Hyper V. You'd be using VMware or something similar. All right, how many people have done cahoots before? Cahoot is amazing. Cahoot's fantastic. Bacon Lord, right? I first off, love the name. Second, yes, this is the first week that we have done our our t together group. Um, we hopefully it's been good. Hopefully, we'll keep doing it. Yeah, we have a, today was a, probably the, the easiest day. We have a lot more details to talk about. So Kahoot is kind of like a quiz platform. It's kind of bar trivia-esque, right? So go ahead and go to Kahoot.it. You can do this on your phone or your, any other dev any device. It doesn't matter what you do it on. And put this game pin in. So you're going to see a quiz question, right? And then you're going to see kind of a timer start counting down. If you answer correctly, you get points. The faster you answer, the more points you get. And it shows you who's ranked after every single uh, every single question. Yeah, this is the first of eight classes. I think to realistically cover all of uh, all of core one, we would need a solid eight classes. Uh, just a heads up, I think if you're watching on um, Twitch, there might be a delay compared to those watching in Discord. Um, so, you know, just just to give you a heads up, because it is based on how quickly you get your question and your answer in. Um, so Kahoot just added something, an option that I hope is I, it's it works, but it's supposed to show the question and answers on their devices now. Oh, nice. So I, I that's I hope it works. <laughs> I really hope it works because that's. They need that for 36 people. Come on. We got like 60 in Discord. Come on, y'all. Don't be scared of the quiz. And yes, it will show question and answer. That's awesome. On the Kahoot app. Yep. So so I left teaching a little over six months ago, and it, it, it didn't have that six months ago. So I was like, oh, this is, I've been begging for this for years. It, I know. <laughs> it was game changing because I teach elementary school, and oh. my kids love it. Yes, finally. Good stuff. By the way, props for being a teacher. You are awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to leave it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I say, I, I I couldn't do uh, well, I couldn't do the the high school thing. Only 45, Scott. Man, I, w I would have lost a bet in Vegas. Uh, some people are scared. I know. Like I said, we do have some crossover, so I don't think we have 100 speak people on right now. Uh, I would say we're probably around the 60 to 70 people um, because I am seeing like a lot of people that have the same username in both Discord and in Twitch. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, Discord and Twitch. So, But, I mean, we're getting up there. We're, we're about to hit 50. I, I have faith. Oh, Tigger, yeah, trust me. He's, it's not that difficult. No, uh, no dude, white flag needed. I honestly don't care. It, I don't care if you get all these questions right or all of them wrong. It really doesn't matter. It's just, uh, you know, the ones you get wrong, uh, hey, note, I need to go back and rehit this a little bit. And, yeah, even if you get them all wrong, that's okay. It's Again, we're not. Yeah, it's fun. not about making fun of anybody or, or making – it's about getting your – where you're at and getting the answers. The, the more you can see questions – the more that you won't be frazzled when questions come up on CompTIA. Mm -hmm. it, it is a skill. Being able to take tests and quizzes is a skill. You need to build that skill. Oh, we're at 49. Got it. Come on. One more person. Get in one, there. One more person. Come on. No problem, Benji. There it is. All right. 30 seconds and we're going to start this. A 
all 50 of them. Uh, is it, well, I guess I should ask, is anybody having trouble getting in? It looks like a couple people got confused with the website URL was. Yeah, so kahoot.it is where you go join the game. Where the quiz is. Okay, what do you mean by donos? Donations. Oh, um, <laughs> Sean and I were talking about that. Man, I, for, uh, man, I forgot. I'm sorry, man. I completely forgot. <laughs> like, oh, I, uh, I did not do that guys, this week. <laughs> we are, you know, first and foremost, you know, Sean, idea of this, and, and I hope I'm not putting words into your mouth, Sean, was to help people. That it, it, This was never about making money. If you are so inclined, we will get something up any little bit helps um but yeah we we that's amazing that you guys even brought that up like right when you said that i was like oh scott told me i should do this and i got busy this week my fault man <laughs> <laughs> my fault <laughs> so let me check the chat real quick so no one no one's having problems getting in to the discord uh the mighty ishmael it's right there at the top four five nine Four four one nine is the pin. Um, or you can use this QR code too. It'll take you right there. Turns, I would love that free Prime sub, but we have to become uh, affiliates to be able to get that. Um, if we keep having people come on like we have right now, then we'll probably get that. But uh, the free Prime subs are awesome. I use mine for Critical Role. Yes, I am a nerd. Save. DD nerd. Save. I own it. I do like the idea of Twitch as an overflow. It just, I mean, Discord offers a little bit more communication that I think is going to be real key when uh, some tedious topics come down the pipe. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I, I do like the Twitch idea, but it would be hard to not have that voice back and forth when it's needed. Yeah, exactly. And as long as people are respectful like they've been doing today and muting until they don't need to, you know, I've only had to server mute maybe like four or five times it's it's worked great <laughs> hey uh after class in discord i'll tell you some horror stories of open mics in my classes some fantastic ones <laughs> 56 people in there bro yeah it's, it's about to go down i'm just glad that you upgraded your kahoot yeah i told you i'd have to All right. I would have thought giving if, away free information has been successful. Yeah, I told Scott, like, when, when we thought about this and thought about making this class public, I was like, we'll make it 20 people in here, maybe. 15, 20 people probably will do it. Uh, whoops. That's good, though. I wonder how a whole, whole wave of certifications coming. All right. Also, keep in mind, if you get disconnected off the quiz, you can jump right back into the quiz at any time. So no stress, all right? All right, do me a favor. Read carefully. Uh, use your notes if you want to, but there's a timer on every question. So keep that in mind. Good luck. told him it wasn't going to be a hard hitter. You went binary right on the first question. No, I didn't. All right. Did, did you have to do any binary in this at all? No. How did you know it was this blue answer? <laughs> odd number, one at the end. Always remember, odd numbers end in a one, even numbers end in a zero. That's really one enough he cut down. You some, you taught that fun. binary lesson so easily. I could teach my grandmother binary. Oh, nice. Well, That's I'm, how thorough and easy that was. I'm hoping if you get binary questions, you don't have to do binary in the test. <laughs> if it's an IP address, even even odd odd or whatever, to take the free two minutes, you know what I mean? <laughs> I give props to the seven people that uh, honestly <laughs> answered the question. <laughs> The minion. minions what hey uh, do you guys I get, I get props do you guys hear a like music background to any of this or not 
I don't negative. Hear, I don't hear anything. Do I have the site muted? Oh, I do. There's some really annoying music that I want you guys to enjoy as well. Josh takes an er, early good. lead. Here we go. If I can hear the music on Twitch, I, I don't hear it on Discord. You don't? I don't know why. All right. One byte is equal to eight nice. bits. So two bytes is 16 bits. Very good. Friendly reminder, a bit is a binary number. A single binary number. Question three of 25. people took the red bait a lot of people took the red bait so remember zero through nine is the same in decimal and hexadecimal so this could be very well found in like an ipv6 hexadecimal format it doesn't have to have letters in it can i have a g there are no g's in the hexadecimal format there are no g's very good sorry that one was a little bit dirty But red is a valid hex number. That is definitely something CompTIA would do. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Question four. Yep, giga is the largest metric prefix there. Like gigahertz, we just discussed in processors, right? Very nice. Well, the leaderboard's solidifying a little bit. That's the first question. It didn't just look like a slot machine. Z, three in a row. Five of 25. Computer does run off Thor power. Yeah. All right. Internal computer components require DC current. AC comes out of the wall. Very good. 40 of us. Ooh, Abe takes the lead. Can Abe hold it? Wait, is this the same AVE I had for A plus net plus security plus? Or is this a different AVE? Let me go check. No, different AVE? Okay, all right, just check it. Again, it's okay if you guys get every one of these wrong. It, the the point matter. is getting the your brain moving in a direction. It's not about, you know, yes, it's about getting them right, but it's not it's not the only thing about it. Yep, I agree 100%. Attenuation, the loss of data or power over distance. And we're going to hit, uh, don't stress about this, we're going to hit a lot of actual real-world examples of attenuation as we go through the different uh, Ethernet standards and whatnot. So no stress. Uh oh, leaderboard changes. Seven to twenty five. Oh, 
Ooh. So, the CompTIA 110-100 rule, right? Remember that 100 milliamps is 0.1 amps. So this is actually double the lethal amperage, 0.2. Very good. There's some curveballs coming. Read carefully. Continuity, very good. Remember, continuity is setting your multimeter to read zero ohms. So continuity tests to see if a cable was actually broken or not. No change in the leaderboard. Tulsi said. Who? Tulsi said it's yeah. nerve-wracking being on the other side of. Usually, I'm the one that's making these for six-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you guys broke my Discord. Um, so like, I can go to the most recent comment, but it, it won't it won't move when there's new comments. I'm not sure if the the voice chat is used to this uh, volume of. <laughs> messages that's all right though no big deal we did it we broke it <laughs> we broke discord um so by the way electrostatic discharge ram right or synchronous dynamic random access memory which we'll talk about in detail on next saturday but ram is very 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 susceptible to static discharge now why can a power supply not be susceptible to esd Grounded. As it, long as, I mean, it has a ground the wall. It's grounded. Yeah. Well, it has a ground built in to the metal chassis of the actual of the actual power supply itself. So, a power supply has a ground built in. Never choose power supply for an ESD question, unless it, unless it's what can you touch to avoid ESD. But you, you can't destroy a power supply with ESD as it has a ground built into it. So keep that in mind, please. Question 10. Hmm. Oh, this, this one was a hard one. So, golden rule in the IT world, you never plug a laser printer into an uninterruptible power supply. So when you, when you fire up a laser printer, a laser printer has something called a high voltage power supply. It can use a huge spike of amperage right off the bat, which can damage or destroy an, a, a UPS. Um, if you're not familiar with laser printers, that's fine. We have a whole detailed section on laser printers we have to hit up later. So no stress on that. But please note, you never plug in a laser printer to a UPS. Weird shenanigans can happen. Donald, it's very interesting. These are the questions you picked for this. They seem very unique. I have no idea what you're talking about. But obviously the quizzes will be on when we hit that day, right? Just as a, a reiteration. 1125. Man, Insta 40 answers. <laughs> All right, that's good.
43 people are correct. The graphics card or video card is always going to be your main consumer of power inside of a, day, a, de, a desktop. Very good. Banfield's coming up. Man, Scott, did I make this too easy? I think we just got good listeners that are good, uh, that are that followed along. I think you're just used to a class where people aren't as <laughs> invested in being in it. <laughs> Why, Rob? Very good. The red cable carries five volts. Standard that you have to know. Thirteen. Yep, 3.3 volts. Don't fall victim to anything that's not exactly 12, 5, or 3.3 exactly. There is no 5.5 or 5.3 or negative 5.5 or 12.3. Don't fall victim to those. You've got to really hammer those because those are, those are just free points if you get those questions. That's all right. I have a feeling these will sneak in feature quizzes. Insert. Or on this lap. Question 14. I think this one's going to be hard. I think we're going to get a, a, a variety. I, I think we're good. I think we're good. I got faith. All right. Better... Better than it could have been. <laughs> so, how many pins are found on the connector design to power a standard 2.5 inch SSD? So, on our whiteboard, we call this a modern hard drive. Kind of my fault on this one because we haven't covered hard drive acronyms yet. So, if you didn't know this SSD was a solid state drive that's only a SATA, it would be hard to break down that that would be your 15 pin SATA power. So, if you got this one wrong, don't worry, we have a lot of hard drive stuff to talk about next Saturday. A lot. Seven pin is only for the SATA data cable. So that seven pin SATA is from the hard drive to the motherboard to carry information. So we definitely can't confuse those two. I don't remember true or false be down here. Oh yeah. <laughs> Forty correct. It is false. Remember, the components will pull what they need. So if you put a 10,000 watt power supply on a little computer, it's not going to throw it into the ground with a bolt of lightning. The components will just pull what they need or what they can use from that available power. A little bit of question about that related to the BIOS and settings I've seen, but I'll wait till later. Okay, okay, no worries. I have a feeling I want to be like, yes, but not by standard. <laughs> Load line calibration, you've heard of it. Yeah, but definitely not an A plus worry, thank God. Oh, hey, a poll. Gonna be like 50 of the green. <laughs> no. Okay. no, everybody's done pretty well so far. There's no points to this, by the way. There's no wrong answer. See, told you, Scott. Oh, nice. See, we're, nice. We're, we're, we're in the yellow. The green is this first day, first day jitters. They'll be in the okay soon. I want to know who's that one that was like too easy. 
Go take your test. You got this. Well, actually, Glenn, it's probably Glenn because he already did his test. Oh, that's true. <laughs> already passed. Good, good. Keep it, keep it up. See, Tulsi, I'm on the opposite end. I'm used to be the one that takes these tests. This is really relaxing for me, to isn't it? Take it. <laughs> oh, it's it's unbelievable. It's like euphoria going on. I don't know why. All right, smallest mobile reform factor from our whiteboard is that Pico ITX. So Pico ITX will be like your Raspberry Pi. They're literally the size of like a credit card. Pico ITX. Desert Dino still in the lead. Not by a lot though. He's top five. If it's anybody's game. And there are harder questions coming. Jeez, I don't think I've ever seen a Kahoot number answer go that quick. That's, yeah. That's, that's a good sign. I think we went over this a few times, though. That's a good sign. Yeah. Very good. That is true. Open the side opposite the I.O. Those are free points. All right, not one person should get this one wrong. It's clearly the BIOS regulator, right? Of course. <laughs> very good most of you most of you went CPU voltage regulator some of you saw CPU and you, you, you took the bait <laughs> that's alright specifically CPU voltage regulator in the top left hand corner of that motherboard Thirty thirty two in under three seconds. <laughs> I don't know if you can see Twitch, but uh, there's been a few people that have been thanking us. Uh, so oh. we we appreciate the thanks and I'm glad that people are getting a lot out of this. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you guys much appreciate it. I'm glad there's uh this many people that want to get certified. All right, remember all those ports, right? USB, speaker ports, your uh your toss link and your your fiber optic audio ports none of those are standardized so you have to memorize them you could have two usb ports on the io or you could have 12 depends on the motherboard five players hit a streak of four man i hope i put a hard question next desire to do an Australian accent when saying the word dingo is through the roof. Select all that apply. Be careful. And if you're new to the IT world, if you get this one, one wrong, that's okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a, you know, this is not something that you're you, to fret about if you don't get this one right. But we did specify two server CPUs specifically. Yes, you did. Ooh, very good. Okay, this one was a rough one, especially with the extra options, right? So, yes, you can come across other processors that are powerful, like my processor or the Intel i9, but by standard, the only ones that are recognized as server-specific processors are going to be Xeons and Epic. Epic's AMD, Xeons are Intel. So you really gotta know those keywords that Xeon is an Intel server, Epic is an AMD server. Good job, that was a hard one.
Very good. A and four is an A and B socket size. Um, do me a favor. This ZIF is a weird acronym. This stands, put this in your notes because it may be on the exam. Zero insertion force. So ZIF describes all modern processors. And the fact that you don't have to push them and actually snap them into the socket anymore. You literally just gently place them into the socket and close the gate, whether it be PGA or LGA. So ZIF is a description of all modern processors. Just a heads up on that acronym. Twenty-three. Yeah, the, force come, okay. the force comes from the uh, the lever that you pull down, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. The CPU has to support virtualization. If you're not sure what this is, no stress. We have a whole virtualization chapter that goes in detail on virtual machines. But I would note now that first and foremost, the CPU has to accept the use of this. Question 24. Very good. So if you're not familiar with this, again, no stress, but when you install a CPU, the first thing you're going to see or actually add to the top of the CPU is thermal compound. So this thermal compound is a kind of a, almost like a toothpaste viscosity, but the thermal conductivity rating of this liquid is extremely high, meaning any, any heat that hits the face the lid of the CPU gets transferred with a quickness to the actual CPU core on top of it. Now, when we talk about gaming PCs, we're going to talk about the right and the wrong way to do this. This is correct. This is trash. So we'll talk about we'll talk about that later. Um, and I have a funny video to show you on that. But the first thing that touches the face of the processor is a CPU thermal compound or thermal paste. It's also called. Uh, I lost the chat. I'm terrible at keeping the chat in view. Man, sorry guys. No, you're doing good. They're they're talking about PS4 stuff, and but it seems like everybody's following along with you. Well, uh, uh, since I said the chat's broken, I just look back and this is 120 plus new messages. <laughs> well, okay, I can't scroll. Last question coming. Ooh, a hundred point lead. We'll see what happens. We're tied. Very good, 675 out of 900 is the passing score for the 1101. Very good. All right, the fancy podium. 20 out of 24. Also 20 out of 24. 22 out of 24. Motivated. <laughs> So pretty good overall, pretty good overall, and it, it gives us a nice breakdown of which topics uh, I can throw into the next quiz as well, which is fun. So my plan is next Saturday's quiz, these difficult questions will be maybe reintroduced in different verbiage next week. 